Patterson and Michael Remus. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to a Wednesday edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson with you, along with Michael Remus. Packed show today. Lots to unpack from another disappointing loss for the Winnipeg Jets last night, heading into the All Star break. A 3 1 regulation loss in Philadelphia against one of the NHL's most struggling teams. And now it's seven days off before 40 games in just over 80 days uh, with very faint playoff hopes alive right now for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Murat Atesh is going to join us coming up in about 15 minutes. We'll chop it up with Murat, get his thoughts on last night's game and, you know, really what the situation is for this hockey club going into the break and more importantly into the month of February. Um, and then we'll talk Jets. More NHL, the upcoming All-Star Weekend, and more with ESPN's Greg Wyshynski. We will touch on football stories. Obviously, a couple of huge stories south of the border. Tom Brady's retirement and the class action lawsuit brought against the National Football League by now former Dolphins head coach Brian Flores. And uh, some big news in the Canadian Football League with uh, Rashid Bailey coming back to the Bombers. That was broken by Justin Dunk. Jay Dunk's going to join us a little later on in the program as well. So lots to get to. Welcome to everybody in chat. Nice to see you all. And a big thanks to our sponsors that make this show happen each and every day, including Culligan Water, Vita Health, F Apparel, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course our betting partner over at Cool Bet Canada. Let's get to it as we welcome in everyone in the chat and a big thank you to everyone listening on podcast. If you are a podcast listener and have the opportunity to give us a five-star rating and a review at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, it is always greatly appreciated. Uh, let's get Remo in here and get this going. Uh, Remo, what's going on? How uh, how are you? What did you think of the game last night? Oh, game? What, what game? I'm just fired up here. Uh... But Rashid Bailey being re-signed, right? Weren't there a lot of questions about the Bombers receivers? And he's coming on tomorrow. That's great. But uh, I mean, as yes, far good as, news, Bomber fans. Yeah. One twenty tomorrow. If you're with us live on YouTube, it'll be our first guest mm. tomorrow on the program. We'll also have Mike McIntyre to chop it up on the Jets at the All Star break. But uh, Showtime Sheed coming to WST tomorrow. Can't wait for that. And uh, yeah, let's start on a happy note. Sheed's back. Yeah. Looking for a three-peat with the Winnipeg Blue yeah. Bombers. Oh, well, I was emailing with Justin Dunk. You want to come on? He's like, man, Bombers looking looking good for a, for a three-peat. So, uh, I mean, they they were here. Everyone else is still down here, I think. But as far as the Jets uh, go, I mean, Dan Asham says in the chat, he says, I can't believe the Jets can beat the Blues, but not the Flyers. And I think that's just what's been so puzzling about the Jets. I think for a while that, you know, you can show up and against a division rival and have a great game. But the next the next game you play the worst team in the league who's had two losing streaks of over 10 games, including one of 14 games. And I mean, you make their goalie look like uh, they make every goalie look like Martin Brodeur. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Us uh, as a tight game. I know a lot of people talking about uh, talking about, uh, you know, the play in the third period. That led to the go-ahead goal. Um, and a lot of people talking about that, but I mean, if you're scoring one goal a game against a team that just lost 14 in a row. You're not going anywhere. And I think the reality is sinking in. And I look at Dom's projections and the Athletic. I was oh all god, optimistic. what's the number today? Okay, so he has the Jets 90 percent chance to miss the playoffs. Um, 10 percent at the All Star break. That I mean. 
That's such a stunning number considering the excitement and the expectations for this team coming into the season. I mean, there's so many different ways we can go with the conversation. We've been having many of them over the course of the last couple of weeks. But, you know, coming off that win against St. Louis with one more game, an opportunity against a team that had been absolute hot garbage for the entire year of 2022, got their first win of the new year on Saturday in overtime against the LA Kings. Um, and Kyle Connor scores early. You get that nice one nothing lead. And uh, just an inability to continue. And, and even more frustrating, Remus. I mean, Philly was without their three centers. Oh, no. <laughs> There's no Kachuri, no Hayes. Like, oh, it is. Um, what a frustrating team. Because at times we have seen glimpses of a team that, you know, can do some pretty excellent things. Um, but, I mean, right now. It is just not, I mean, there is absolutely no consistency. And what was so concerning about yesterday, Reem, in my opinion, at least, and we'll hear what people have to say in chat, and we'll certainly talk about it with Marat. Um, you know, we've heard a lot, and certainly from Connor Hellebuck, who I think I said the right things coming out of that Pittsburgh game. Uh, you know, this is the time when good teams start winning and finding a way to win and keep on doing it. And, um, you know, listen, it was just one game. But with Eric Comrie, the backup in, you know, three young defensemen in for injured players. The way they stepped up and got that win in St. Louis, I think gave people some hope that, you know, you, you go into Philadelphia working with a little bit of momentum, keep that going, get a win. You can get up to three games above NHL 500 and put yourself in a much better situation coming into that game next Tuesday against the Minnesota Wild when all these makeup games are beginning to be played. Uh, but... Oh, man, a third period with a real lack of intensity. I mean, the bottom line is the Philadelphia Flyers just simply wanted that game more than the Winnipeg Jets. And, um, you know, you make a couple mistakes uh, that, you know, I mean, you know, people have their own thoughts on, you know, what Philly Anal was doing on the uh, on the play that ended up going the other way for the winner. Um, you know, you like some of that aggressiveness and trying to score a game, but uh, trying to score a goal to win the game. But at the same time, I mean, every one of these points is so valuable. Um, but, you know, when you miss that opportunity, it ends up going the other way. Um, and, you know, Neil Pionk's not able to break up the two-on-one and a rebound's put in. Um, you know, you, you, I mean, the, all, all that work can be for naught. And, uh, man, it's, uh, it, it, the, these are dark times right now for the Winnipeg Jets. I don't really know how to say it much differently than that. I mean, the 10% number might even be high right now when you really think about it. I mean, you know, we'll get into this with Murat as to what this team needs to do. Um, but sitting here at one game above NHL 500, uh, going into the final 40 games, folks, this is what it's going to take. 24 wins, 11 losses in regulation, and five overtime points or shootout losses. 13 games above 500 to get to 14 above, which would give them, you know, which would I think gets you into the playoffs, 95, 96 points. Like, can the Winnipeg Jets do that? There's probably not a lot of people that have a lot of confidence that that can happen right now. Now, I mean, there's a lot of things that can change, I guess. But, um, wow, I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I, I I really thought that game was imperative to get last night, Remus. And, um, man, the third period was just so disappointing the way that it happened. Mark Shapley losing a battle with Scott Lachlan on the side of the boards, which was a big part of it. And, obviously, some missed opportunities as well. I mean... You know, a, the beautiful pass by Nate Schmidt to set up Shifley and Wheeler on that two on O. And, um, you know, Shifley getting over to the captain, you know, putting it right into the goaltender, Carter Hart. And, um, you know, especially as the third period continued on, I mean, the Philadelphia Flyers, as I said, just sort of seemingly wanted that game more. And uh, that's got to be incredibly frustrating for Dave Lowry. And I'd imagine every member of that Winnipeg Jets team will probably do some soul searching over the course of the next week. Yeah, and I think that that's why after the last game, you, you got excited because we know this team has talent. They're spending to the salary cap, but to be this far out of it at this point, I didn't see this coming. We famously, or now infamously, raised the off-season <laughs> champs banner, which uh, we should probably send this that's one to. That's on us. We're that's gonna on us. We're going to send that to Old Takes Exposed. Um, maybe the worst thing we ever did on this show, although we were having fun, it was the summer... Hey, there was a ton of excitement. I there mean, was excitement. Everyone there was... did really feel that. I mean, think about that. And it's, mm -hmm. listen, it wasn't us. I mean, we weren't sitting here saying the Jets were going to win the Stanley Cup. No. But a lot of people that watched this team and watched the National Hockey League from around the league, you know, had the Jets as, you know, a contender. And I know a few people, prominent people in the media that actually said this was the year for the Winnipeg Jets. So 
Um, all of that in the background makes where we're at that much more stunning. And to think that it's happening with this huge bounce back season, where would this team be without Pierre-Luc Dubois? If Pierre-Luc Dubois was the Dubois from the last half of last season, what are we talking about? The Habs? The Coyotes? The Flyers? Who beat the Jets last night? I mean, ugh. Hard to wrap your head around, but what a puzzling team right now, Reem. And um, man, there's a lot of work for Dave Lowry to do. Um, you know, he obviously is the interim head coach. I think that if things continue to go the way that they're going, um, probably unlikely that, you know, you get an opportunity to come back and do it again next season. And for the first time in a long time, there are legitimate conversations about sort of blowing it up for lack of a better lack of a better term. I mean, I think that the Jets organization has really liked, you know, most of the pieces that they put together. Um, but that's why the confidence was so high going into this year. And, um, you know, with where the team is right now, you know, essentially, um, you know, just with a slight, a faint, faint hope of getting back into playoff contention, um, you know, many of those conversations I said that, you know, might be happening in March. I mean, depending on what happens when they come out of the break, it could be happening at the end of February. Which, um, which is that much more stunning and obviously will certainly lead to some significant change somewhere in the organization. And whether that's management, whether that's coaching, I certainly think part of the team will change going forward if things don't do a complete U-turn coming out of the break. Um, as I said, there's still a lot of hockey left to be played, but 24-11-5, that's what this team needs to do just to sneak into a wild card spot right now. And uh Tell you what, the, what we've seen so far from this team, there's not a lot of people, I think, that have confidence that the Winnipeg Jets can go and all of us start winning at that clip, even if you think that they have the talent in the dressing room to do it. Yeah, so pretty much about a 10% chance of that happening if you go by uh, you know, what Dom's projected uh, for them at the Athletic. And again, spending to the cap, we thought they would have uh, definitely a playoff team. I mean, a lot of models had them high up. Uh, it is definitely a surprise that we're here. We're going to be talking a lot about trade deadline, um, you know, trying to get assets. I don't know if you need a full rebuild, but definitely you're going to have to make some changes heading into next year. And I see a lot of people in chat uh, talking about the GM, Kevin Cheveldayoff, Jeff Hamilton tweeting today. Uh, for those curious about when the Jets leadership plan the Jets leadership plan to address the current state of the team. Expectations are Shevel Dayoff will be holding a presser sometime early next week. So enjoy your all-star break. That's <laughs> Jeff. But I mean, we talked yesterday. I mean, it would have been so nice. Just get it. I mean, even if they don't make the play, just get a win so we can feel good for a week in between these games. Beat the lowly Philadelphia Flyers. And they can't even do that. Although, I don't know, should the Jets feel so bad? I mean, Colorado lost yesterday as like minus 500 favorites, 555 yeah, minus 588. To, uh, to Arizona. <laughs> so, I mean, teams lose, but I mean, it's too much from the Jets losing the teams below them in the standing, like Vancouver, um, Arizona, Buffalo. I mean, these, these losses add up, and, those are the, and playoff teams win those games more often than not in the Jets. I mean, we keep hearing the same thing about, um, about, you know, consistency and, you know, sticking to the game plan. It's a lot of the same, same stuff over and over again. And it's uh, frustrating and, and kind of disappointing, I think. No, no doubt about it. Hey, Brian Bottas, thanks very much for the super chat. Brian Bottas says some love for all the great content you guys provided over the years. Most damning thing is 55 and 26 line out high danger chance 7-0 still led in time on ice. Um, and, you know, the time on ice was relatively even last night. I mean, there wasn't any real big discrepancy. Kyle Connor was the number one uh, ice time leader on the club uh, with 21 minutes, but he also did play four minutes shorthanded. Um, you had Mark Shifley in at 1848, Blake Wheeler in at 1855. Uh, let's see, what Cole Perfetti was 15 minutes, and Pierre-Luc Dubois was 17. So, I mean, both of those top two lines um, you know, maybe the Shifley line got an extra shift or two, but I'm sort of with you. Um, you know, they they were not able to uh, make it have. I don't know how they were zero in high danger chances. I mean, if they had a two on O, I mean, that was certainly a high danger chance. Sometimes those numbers <laughs> on particular games, I don't entirely know. But listen, everyone knows. Anyone that's watching this team knows that they need to get more to 55 um, and, and, and certainly more from Wheeler. I mean, I... I I hesitate to jump on him considering that he just came back from injury. And to be honest, I think that he's been, you know, playing quite well and, and, you know, doing what he can do. But uh, listen, 
this is a this is a broken record almost at this show at this time because um you know this team will go uh, as far as a few players will take them Connor Hellebuck's number one on that list um and Mark Shifley has always been the number two guy on that list that's sort of changed right now it's Dubois it's Kyle Connor um certainly playing with Cole Perfetti right now that's been the most productive line. Uh, but there hasn't been a lot of success right now for that number two line. They're playing a lot, and there's been pretty much nothing from the bottom six so far. So, uh, I mean, uh, all uh, pretty much at every level, minus a couple players, this team has underperformed and been underwhelming so far this season. And you add all that up, Remus, and we're talking about a team with an incredibly mediocre record of one game above 500, which um, in the National Hockey League, We'll probably end up getting you about 24th overall or so at the end of the season, which, uh, let's face it, was not part of the plan for this year. No, I thought they would be trading away a first-round pick, but now they're going to be looking to get some of those picks back that they traded away to acquire defensemen. Um, again, uh, real real tough situation. Yeah, and I, I do think one of the you know key problems, I mean, it's been all year. It's either, you know, you got the whatever the line one going or line two going never at the same time. And you're not getting any offense from, you know, your bottom six forwards. And I think that's, that's definitely key when you're struggling, you need guys to step up, but they just can't, they haven't seemed to get the goals. And then, you know, Helba can only, can only do so much us. Well, you know, for sure. And, and let's face it. I mean, <clears throat> I've been saying, you know, I wanted to see this team playing like their playoff the lives were on the line for, you know, the last couple of weeks. And at times we've seen it, at times we haven't. Uh, but, I mean, there really seemed to be a, a lack of, of of will, of push in that third period when there was so much on the line last night. And, you know, of course, you know, a, a, an unfortunate mistake, not a great pass from Dubois. I mean, I'll put him in on that play as well. Um, and certainly Vili Hanel had taken a, a, a really, making a real risky play in a tie game that ended up biting the team. And, um, you know, that's a learning experience for a young player right now but maybe we're seeing why they've been hesitant to put some of these young guys in at times because uh, the jets don't have the uh rope right now to blow games with learning lessons for young players maybe that's going to be the case for the rest of the season because the playoffs are gone um they're not at that point yet but man i mean just over the course of the past two weeks we've talked about a team that you know was in and around a 40 percent chance of making it to about 10. um we didn't hear from Wheeler or Shifley after the game, uh, and not because they didn't want to talk. I mean, I heard Jeff talk afterwards. He was the one uh, local reporter that, were, that was there, um, and he talked to Josh Morrissey and Paul Stastny. And I, I know why he talked to Paul Stastny, is I think because Paul Stastny's been the one guy that has actually given some thoughtful, sincere, real answers from a guy with so much experience. But there was one comment he had from last night's post game that really sort of stood out to me and now uh, let's play it right now and then we'll uh then we'll chop it up with Murata Tesh. Yeah, I think you always want to especially you got a break now you kind of always want to go in there on a, on a kind of positive attitude on a win and, and um you don't so you're gonna have that sour taste in your mouth a little bit but uh you know we know we gotta we gotta refresh kind of refresh mentally more than anything because I think physically you know we got we got a kind of busy workload coming up but um you know, we know what we got in there and, and you know, we know when we're playing our game, you know, we compete with anyone and I think it's a matter of kind of getting everyone on the same page and I think sometimes, you know, we've had, you know, different different guys show up some nights, some guys not and but that's gonna happen and sometimes you gotta carry those guys and I think we gotta just stick together. The end of that comment just kind of blew me away. I mean, sometimes you have some guys show up, other times not, and um, you know you have to you have to pick them up going forward. I mean, there's nothing untrue with what Paul Stastny says. Although, to be honest, when I heard that, um, I was sort of taken aback because of just the the frankness and the way he delivered it. I mean, it wasn't direct scud at one player or another, but it's pretty clear that you know he's exactly right. They haven't had everybody show up often enough this season, and that's why they're in the predicament that they're in right now. Um, so Greg Wyshynski coming up a little later on. We will chat on a bunch of football topics with Justin Dunk a little bit later, uh, but we're going to have Murata Tesh join us right away. Uh, but a big shout-out to our friends over at F Apparel, a great partner downtown at 190 Smith Street, Winnipeg and Manitoba's leading spot for custom-made suits and menswear. Um, you know, listen, every guy needs a suit that looks great and fits going into the new year. And uh, apparently... 
little loosening of restrictions. We'll get to that. You're going to have some butts and seats at games and you know maybe some gatherings as well. You'll want to have a great suit for the upcoming year. And F's custom-made suits begin at just $3.99. Um, they're the go-to guys for weddings and wedding suits for more than 10 years. And wedding partners, wedding parties get 15% off their purchase when they order a suit, shirt, and tie. Find out more at F Apparel. Go visit them at 190 Smith Street or check them out online or book an appointment at F, that's E-P-H Apparel, uh, dot com. We're into February and it is heart month. Um, the hearts of Jets fans, I think, have taken... Uh, taken a toll over the course of the last month. Maybe maybe February will be kinder to you all. Uh, but when it comes to you being kind to your heart, start off at Vita Health Fresh Market on health, healthy supplements and foods to make a difference in your life. Great prices on Winnipeg's best selection of natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, and delicious lunch options like Vita Market salads, soups, sandwiches and more and if you can't make it into the store visit the website at myvita.ca to shop online or schedule a delivery with instacart vita health fresh market seven winnipeg locations including the newest store in linden ridge and online at myvita.ca and uh, you know nothing better for your for the ticker and your body overall than making sure you're stocked up and hydrated with the best water around and that of course is from our friends over at culligan water celebrating 65 years in business as a local family-owned operation, uh, hydrating Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba over at 1200 Sargent. Uh, they got water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, citywide delivery services as well, in addition to commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Uh, check them out online at drinkculligan.com or give the Culligan man a call at 204 694 5180. All right, let's welcome in our good friend Murat Atesh from The Athletic. Uh, Murat, great to have you on. Hey, listen, before we get to last night's game and the current plight and predicament that the Winnipeg Jets are in, I just wanted to um, congratulate you on such an amazing piece on Johnny Kovacevic and let people know that if they have not read this, um, this is just some great storytelling. And, you know, in a very disappointing season, sometimes stories like that are needed right now. And, uh, you know, he talked about the scenic route that he took to the National Hockey League. And uh, you dove in the amazing backstory of his family. Um, you've done a lot of great work in the athletic, but that was right up there with some of the best. Oh, man. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a story that kind of chokes me up because it's such a hard road that his parents at different stages of their upbringings walked to get to Canada, to, to get to a situation where they could give Johnny and his siblings, you know, a better life than perhaps they grew up with, especially Angie, his mom, who grew up on a farm without running water or electricity. Um, his dad separately working in Sarajevo in Bosnia um, right before wars broke out in the 90s and sort of getting a lay of the land that this might not be a place to be and sort of his escape from there to, to help uh, to come to Canada to meet Angie to start the family. And um, it, it just puts so much in context a lot of the time as we go up and down with the wins and losses of a team. Uh, we zoom in on, you like to call it the the toy aisle, I think, right? Sports is the toy aisle. Yeah, toy, toy aisle. department. Toy department, there we go. And and then sometimes you see stories like this one of the Kovacevic family that are, are really beyond that and they really transcend sport. And this one this one gets me. You know, I, you asked me to tell me tell you what I'm working on from time to time and I never know what to say, but like if I can make a plea, read this one. Read this one for sure. It, it, it means a lot. And uh, it, there's no doubt in my mind that his family upbringing is a huge part of why all these coaches, all these scouts, all these people that I talk to call – Johnny Kovacevic, the least entitled, most humble, most grateful person that that they've ever dealt with. And, and it's nice to see people like that getting into their first couple of NHL games. Yeah, I mean, I've heard uh, the same thing from everyone that's interacted with Johnny with the Manitoba Moose. And, uh, you know, to go through the backstory and find out more was uh, was great. Well, I listen, I wanted to touch on that. I think I retweeted it last night. So if you're wondering where it is, go to Marat's page or just go to mine. And it's there uh, at theathletic.com. Uh, I figured I'd start off on a little bit of a positive because last night's hockey game certainly was not that, Marat. Um, 42 games in, one game above NHL 500 at the All-Star break. I mean, nah, there's no way you can sugarcoat this. This has been an incredibly disappointing 
run for the Winnipeg Jets. And man, that loss last night makes it even more imposing to try to realistically get on a run and get back into playoff contention just for the second wild card, never mind the division, with 40 games left in what, 81 days? Yeah, it's it's a long road. It's a tough road. There, There's just an inordinate amount of games per day that they're going to have to play. And there's a ton of points that they have to make up, a ton of teams that they have to pass. Uh, if you look at the athletic, I think uh, as of last night, Dom's probabilities had the Winnipeg Jets playoff chances as below 20% at this stage. Uh, we're at 10 and now after for, that loss. Pardon me? We're at 10 now after that loss. Are you kidding me? So... <laughs> Like we're we're in Hail Mary territory on this season for the Winnipeg Jets, and that's absurd, isn't it? I mean, I believed in the upgrades. I see value in Nate Schmidt. I see value in Brendan Dillon. I continue to believe that the forwards are pretty good. You know what I mean? Like they're I saw this team as a playoff team when the when the offseason was over and camp broke. I see enough young pieces to like. I see enough veteran pieces that are still contributing. Even against Philadelphia last night, Blake Wheeler had drive to him. That line was going. They were producing a certain amount of chances. But the Winnipeg Jets getting completely worked in shot quality against the Philadelphia Flyers in a must-win game heading into the All-Star break with the record that they have and the playoff aspirations that they have, I mean... That's not good enough. And I think that we're all doing this gut check right now, being this team that, you know, we've been able to make excuses for here, there, the other place. This person had COVID. That person got hurt. Nick Ehlers' injury is still significant. All of those sorts of things. They needed to be better than they were last night. And they needed to get the finish on the two on O's. They need to make better decisions with the puck. And, you know, to hear Paul Stastny put it in a perspective like you guys just played, I mean, this should be a better team for so many different reasons. Yeah. I mean, the Stastny quote was, I mean, at the end was, it, it, I mean, was very telling. I mean, you know, sometimes some guys are showing up, other times uh, they aren't. And, um, I mean, you're not even going to come close to doing what this team needs to do if everyone isn't showing up each and every night to use the uh, the quote. I mean, I just did the math here. I mean, if you think that, you know, to guarantee yourself into a spot, you need to get to, say, 14 games over 500. There's 40, 40 games left, Marat. They're going to need to win 24 of those, limit themselves to 11 regulation losses, and get five points in overtime. That would get them to 14 points. I mean... It's hard to imagine a turnaround like that, considering what we've seen. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that believe in this club and know that they're capable of winning on any given night, but it is the uh, the lack of being able to put any sort of stretch of this together. I mean, a couple good games and then a stinker. You know, you beat a good team like St. Louis and then you lose to Philadelphia. I mean, um, you know, you, you might need the autopsy on this club at the end of the season will be fascinating. I'm not willing to stick the final nail in the coffin yet, but. I mean, to think that we're talking about a team with a 10% playoff chance at the break, essentially the halfway point to the season, is absolutely stunning. And it begs some more big-time questions about the organization from management. Obviously, coaching has been interesting with an interim coach in right now. Um, and certainly, certainly questions about the core of this team that's been kept together pretty much intact for the better part of the last half decade. Well, if we continue to roll with the sort of win record that we've seen and the sort of performances from that core that you're talking about, this might escalate into questions about the future. In my mailbag this week, you know, so many questions are about should Mark Shifley be traded? And you and I have talked about it as this pie in the sky, not pie in the sky, the opposite of that, but this this sort of thing that you would never even imagine being a realistic conversation to have. And now the message boards are calling for it. That's a shock. And that's, again, it's a, in a sense, it's unacceptable based on the performance of the player. Um, and you also look at the rest of the core. You have Blake Wheeler. He's doing his best to drive. He is not that elite five-on-five -five player anymore. You have that Connor and Dubois pairing that's working most of the time. And then beyond that, there's not a lot that, seems to work the disappearance of the nominal first line for the winnipeg jets based on shifley and wheeler is is an issue and they can't be a a, a no-show offensively in the in the second half of the season for the jets to have any chance if they are well they won't outscore their defensive woes and and then the the fact that a player like mark shifley has had defensive woes for as long as he has 
this will be the first time he's ever gone on to not outscore them. So why is that? What's going on within this fabric of this team that claims not to have an identity, uh, in Mark Shifley's words? I mean, this could be... You can look at Mark Shifley's lack of offense this season through the scoring chance lens. You can you can go clip by clip, play by play. I can picture posts. I can picture him getting robbed on slot shots. I can picture him skying one-timers. They're all there. These are the kinds of plays that if you put the highlight reel together and you look at his shooting percentage cratering this season, you can believe that the guy is going to rebound and you can believe that the offense is going to be there. He's still creating chances like a 30-goal scorer. But the other side of the game where you, you talk about the flybys, you talk about the pucks given away at the offensive blue line in his own zone, all these other sorts of things, and you hold it to that sometimes looks passionate offense, sometimes doesn't, and you wonder, what's really going on in this situation? What, How much gut check is needed? Is that gut check available? And these are the kinds of questions that, yeah, might get blown out of proportion sometimes, but this is a Winnipeg Jets team that needs its number one center to play like that and is looking mm-hmm. at this 10% chance of making the playoffs – and I don't single him out. I, I've always pointed to, I've, I've pointed to him a lot lately. I don't single him out to say he is the issue because believe me, a player who creates offense like him generally helps the team win and has done so much so and will do again. But when he's not, then look how far the bottom falls out. No, exactly. I mean, I think it's safe to say that the uh, RFP for the Shifley statue outside the rink is on hold right now. Uh, and, 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 you know, listen, our, our, our conversation earlier in November was more a big picture conversation about this team looking ahead that, you know, it wasn't going well. There was big questions about Paul Maurice. And even at that time we were talking about like, well, what if this team doesn't make the playoffs? I mean, they're a cap team. They put so much in, I mean, in a lot of ways, Kevin Sheveldayoff went all in on this group. Um, and they're not rewarding that confidence or the investment that the organization has made in it. And if that's the case and you're talking about big changes, the coach is one thing. The other is, you know, is the team. And, you know, the Shifley contract is such a big part of any conversation that we're going to be talking about because you've got some more term on Kyle Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, younger players. Um, And I mean, it was more like, okay, if things don't work and you realize you're at a certain point going to be getting out of the Mark Shifley business, I mean, he's not going to be getting a a new contract and being a jet for life. At what point do you start making, start considering that? Because I mean, there is a huge value in that player, especially at what he's making with two years left on the contract. Never in a million years that I think that we might be actually talking about that this season before the trade deadline, Marat. But a big part of that was the fact that I mean, no one could have imagined this team being where they are in the standings right now. And again, I'm not advocating, you know, hey, they got to get this guy. out. I'm just saying that if they are not in the playoffs and, you know, with three weeks to go before the trade deadline, the Jets are basically done. The the things that Kevin Sheveldayoff will have to consider um, would be things that we couldn't have even imagined at the beginning of the season. But that is just reality with where they are as an organization. And the big questions is to, okay, you're going to change the coach. Do you think that just a coach is going to come in and change this team that's one game under 500 to a Stanley Cup contender? I'm not sure there's a lot of people that have that confidence right now. So if that's the case, what are you changing? And what can you use to make the biggest difference going forward, given what you've acknowledged that you know might not be... a eight figure a year deal for Mark Shifley to play his entire year, his career in Winnipeg. Well, I mean, let's, here's the way I think about this. I could divide it up into sort of levels of, I want to call it panic, but levels of how conservative the Winnipeg Jets want to be. And let's say that the Winnipeg Jets are not in the playoff race. Well, we, we see that right now, but trade deadline comes level one, conservative, stay the course, that's look at the pending UFAs and make decisions. And, you know, Andrew Kopp is one of them. Paul Stastny is another. Nathan Beaulieu is the third. Um, and look to shop those players. Nathan Beaulieu, I'm not sure what you're getting back for him. Andrew Kopp, I mean, the right deal could pull a first or at least a multiple seconds or something to that effect. And that's a player that I wouldn't anticipate Winnipeg traditionally thinking of trading either, except for the fact that he's essentially fast-tracked his path to unrestricted free agency status And he's a guy who's been talking about Winnipeg needing to show more will for the last couple of years. I mean, if he's developed a sense of frustration on that regard, I don't know what Winnipeg's odds of signing him at the end of the season are. 
Meanwhile, Paul Stastny, uh, the conscience of the team right now, what's that price point going to be? At what point do they move on at, at that stage? I would want a player like that back, but depending on the price point in the contract, that's level one. That is level one for me of Winnipeg's not in the playoffs. Here's a certain level of playing, um, of reading the room and playing it appropriately. Uh, level two is players with term on their deals. And we know that having seen Jonathan Kovacevic play, Billy Hainala, we have a lot to talk about, <laughs> but uh, his future is bright regardless of, uh, of what the, the, the Twitter says at present. Um, Dylan Sandberg has showed well. Logan Stanley will return to health. At some point, there's going to need to be room for these young players. So level two for me is looking at defensemen with term on their deal. And I don't know that this cat catastrophe of a year is the time to move on from a Brendan Dillon or a Dylan DeMello or a Nate Schmidt. You know what? I, I honestly think that should there be some sort of cultural change on the horizon, you might be able to return many of those players. But that's the sort of thing that's going to have to happen at some point in the evolution of this team. I don't know which player that is, but a defenseman with term and money. And then level three is recognizing if this is the case that Mark Shifley would be, you know, of more value to the Winnipeg Jets as a trade piece than as a, as the franchise center. I'm not there yet because I expect some amount of rebound unless there, is, there are relationships that are severed, unless there is just a level of stubbornness. Sometimes a change is good. That that type of scenario, uh, because the player is of quality. I, I've seen some managers and executives talk about extra years on the deal being a negative right now because of the cap situation being what it is. I think that exists to a certain degree. Where, but in Mark Shifley's case, where he's six point one two five million for the production that he he has, I think that if a team really wanted to add that player, they'd move what they needed to move to fit him. So then the question would become about price. You know, can you pull off the Jacob Truba coup, which is get a young younger player to step into a similar role plus a pick? And you know what, that's a exceedingly difficult move to make in my opinion, especially mid-season uh, during perhaps what's going to be the worst year. Uh, of any that preceded it and probably worse than the ones that come after it as well. So for me, it's too soon, but gosh, if they don't rebound and if he doesn't rebound and if there are relationships that are involved as well, that's an if, of course, then 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 that is something that's on our horizon as people who talk about the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I, I guess the one thing I'll say, and this goes back to the original conversation, it was that, you know, come the end of this year when they're evaluating things, you know, it, it if they realize that, okay, this is not a guy that we think we're going to be going in a different direction. We're going to sign Pierre-Luc Dubois. We're going to do these things. We won't have the money. and won't be able to invest in Mark Shifley for another big money deal with a significant raise based on his production over the time here. You're going to move on from him. Um, the contract is so valuable. And we talk about term. Like term for a lot of players is a negative. The term on Mark Shifley's deal, I think, is an absolute positive. And, you know, if all of a sudden we're moving up the conversation to happen during this season. You're talking about an elite point a game offensive player coming in with two years of term at relatively good value based on historical numbers and three playoff runs, Murat. I mean, that to me, and that was almost the basis of the conversation to begin with. If we're talking about this as assets and asset management and looking at the big picture, the value of that asset to a contending team that would have Mark come in and not be the number one guy, I think would have huge value. And, you know, that would absolutely be the sort of move that would... I don't think you could probably change up the core more than a move like that. Now, again, I'm not advocating for that right now, but I am saying that what we thought that might actually be a conversation that could happen way down the road with the way that this team has played so far this season and the struggles he's had in particular and his importance to the club, um, all of a sudden, there's no doubt about it. Kevin Sheveldayoff has to be thinking about that and checking out all of his options heading into the 21st of March. Yeah, it would be wild for Kevin Sheveldayoff to not even consider that an option. Absolutely. It would be wild, especially a guy that tends to think multiple seasons down the road at the at the most normal of times. I mean, to, to not explore that as an idea would be I, I I just I couldn't make sense of that because of of the stakes. Especially, of course, Sheveldayoff has more information than we do. I mean, he'll know what the sense around Pierre-Luc Dubois and a ex long-term extension is. And he'll have a sense of his evaluation of whether this is the new normal, whether Pierre-Luc Dubois can continue to ascend, all of those sorts of things as well. I mean, 
a shifley move of that gargantuan implication is something that I think a team can make if it feels confident in Pierre-Luc Dubois being around for the long haul at a price point they feel comfortable with. I mean, for all, I mean, Cole Perfetti's arrival, that's exciting, but there's a possibility he's a long-term winger at the NHL level. You need you need that anchor in Pierre-Luc Dubois. And honestly, to win, you need the best version of Mark Scheifele, or if you don't think you can get that, then it's time to retool. And that sort of sets the the winning window back. And one of the things, like, I don't want to undersell the player. We're talking about him as if he has great value, and he does, absolutely, based on his production. Um, You hear me harp about his defense from time to time. You see it online. And the interesting thing to me about that is whenever I write a piece that shows video, that shows data, that points to to Shifley's, you know, I, I think I've written that he plays defense sometimes as if winning the puck back is somebody else's job. That line has been quoted back to me by people on other teams in the National Hockey League that they agree with. So there's a certain sense of the cat out of the bag to a certain degree on this player where if other teams are thinking this way, I, I'm not surprised if the Winnipeg Jets are as well and considering their future options. Um, and then the, the package becomes, you know, becomes everything in terms of resetting it and resetting the core, resetting the culture, resetting all of that, which is what trading Mark Shifley would do. Last thought, I monologued at you, Huss, but the Winnipeg Jets also need to have learned their lessons from the contracts they gave to Andrew Ladd, to Blake Wheeler, to even Dustin Bufflin, probably still capable towards his mid-30s. But, you know, we've seen Brian Little as well. We've seen what happens to players in their mid-30s. You have to be, you know, as good as Wheeler was to even be a middle six winger at this stage uh, of the game. You have to be the Zidane Charas of the world. You have to be of the absolute elite elites. And this is a player whose overall contribution to winning we're questioning right now through the heart of his career. I mean, that's not a player I want to be paying 10 plus million dollars when he turns 35. That's for sure. No, you know, it's a great point. And just, I mean, one more on that, uh, you know, this, this final 40 games, if we get to that, for Scheif uh, is going to be fascinating because I mean, all year long, I've really from the get go, uh, I was expecting this maybe to be Mark Scheifele's best season. I mean, you look at his age, he is right in the prime of his career. There was the carrot of making the Canadian Olympic team, which I thought would be maybe the biggest kick in the rear to get him to do all the things that he needed to do to, to be one of the top players representing Canada. And then there was the internal challenge with the rise of Pierre-Luc Dubois playing that we had, I mean, I, I've been waiting for the best of Mark Shifley to come out, and that hasn't happened. And if it hasn't happened to this point with all of that, um, what can we expect in the final 40 games? And uh, from a Jets fan's perspective, you hope that maybe this week away will be good and we'll see a guy that comes back refreshed, recharged, and a guy that the guy that has played at such a high level at times. Um, because right now, it's just not happening for him, and it's not happening for the hockey club, and that's why we're talking about a team that you know could be selling a number of assets going into uh, the trade deadline. You mentioned Vili Hainala. Um, we've seen the good and the bad of Vili so far. I mean, the first couple games were rough for him. I thought he was great on Saturday afternoon. Played almost 20 minutes with Neil Pionk. We really saw some of the things that you know get people out of their seats and why Jet fans and management have been so excited about his potential. Um, we saw some of it on both sides last night as well. Um, what did you make of the play that ended up, um, you know, going the other way for uh, for a goal? And, um, you know, was that just a poor time for Vili to decide to try something like that? Or you think, hey, they're trying to win a hockey game. That was an aggressive play. Unfortunately, ended up in the back of their net. Well, for me, that's, yeah, that's a crucial play. It, it ends up deciding the game. But I have zero time for the thought that that is the play that is the reason Winnipeg didn't beat Philadelphia. If you look at the quality of play on both ends, Philadelphia got to the dangerous areas. They got to rebounds. They created more chances. Winnipeg had trouble getting to the front of the net. They had their own chances. A 2 on oh, they don't finish. There are other opportunities that the Winnipeg Jets don't finish. So I am not pinning the outcome of the game on this play, and I want that to be my preface. Um, And the other thing that I'll say is that on the aggregate, in the long term, over the course of his career, over the course of most games, I want Ville Hainala playing the most aggressive brand of hockey he feels comfortable playing because I believe that he's going to create more than he gives up. That's the, the aggregate on the whole with four minutes to go against an Eastern Conference team. So a three point game doesn't mean as much to me. I have. Plenty of time for saying, okay, we'll play a little bit more conservatively as well. 
Um, so the timing, I have room for a little bit of debate on, even though on the aggregate, I want him playing more aggressively. The play itself, he has the puck on the blue line. He's made eye contact with Pierre-Luc Dubois. Dubois has space. Um, then you have Paul Stastny beside the net. He's in the midst of losing his stick, so he becomes kind of a non-factor. You have Jansen Harkins curling out of the sort of the right wing towards the middle of the ice as well. And that's where you can be absolutely sure that there's miscommunication or a misread of some kind. If you're Ville Hainala, you have one man to beat with that pass. Uh, at, at the top, there's a Flyers forward pressuring Hainala. He beats him with the pass to, to Pierre-Luc Dubois. He steps into the lane. That is a textbook give and go. That is an aggressive play. That's the kind of thing that you can defend uh, as a decision most of the time. But you see the play go off the rails. Uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois passes into traffic. I think it hits something. The pass ends up being waist high. But you also see a little bit of miscommunication because Jansen Harkins doesn't make the same read. Jansen Harkins is looking at the play, and he's cutting into the middle of the ice as well. So what Winnipeg ends up with is a lack of coverage for the defenseman who pinched. Everything goes to crap. The puck goes up in the air, and all of a sudden it's a two-on-one. So Hanela makes a defensive a defensible play for me. He sees a lane. If you pause the screen at, at the opportu- at the time he makes the pass to Dubois, there's a give and go on the table, and it's one I want Hanela to make often. What he needs is a forward to recognize that and cover. And what he also probably needs, though, is the situational awareness at four minutes um, with the players on the ice. That's a that's a mixed bag of a line as well at that moment. Dubois, Stasty, and Harkins. Um, there, I think, are contextual reasons for him to play that more passively um, at the same time as I don't pin the entirety of that that goal on on that decision. So, you know, I, I come out of it and I think not then, not at that time, but let's not act as if that's some horrific read on his part. Let's not act as if it completely takes away from the potential and the promise of this young man's career. Yeah, I mean, it's not like the Jets were completely dominating that third period and that was just the one that happened to go the other way. I mean, you know, and that was the biggest question. I mean, what or where was the team that, you know, you that needed to be playing with that desperation, that urgency, that will that, you know, hasn't been there enough and wasn't there against a team that were missing three centers last night and basically uh, is already in next year territory. Um, Marat, before we go, uh, I do have to just ask you, um, going into this next week, um, what do you think, what, what's Dave Lowry doing over the course of this next week? What's going through his head? Because, um, you know, you've got 40 games left. I sort of laid it out 24, 11 and five. I mean, that is an incredibly high bar, nowhere close to the way they played. Um, I wonder how the coach handles uh, coming back out of the break. Well, I think Dave Lowry is in a unique position in that he has absolutely nothing to lose at this moment. Winnipeg's record has cratered. Winnipeg's record was, they were struggling um, prior to Paul Maurice's departure, but certainly after a couple of games that look like promise, they, they, they've they cratered in the last little while. He has a break. He has a pause. He gets to send his, his, uh, his players uh, have had the discussions about going to wherever they're going, taking a break, taking a pause, reflecting on what they need to do to be better. So Lowry in my mind has the ability to say, I have nothing to lose. I, he all what am i trying to say i'm trying to say that the decision is stick to the game plan assuming that a rejuvenated group of players uh, having the pause having the reflection is going to come in and play like he's asked them to play or wants them to play or hopes that they're going to play down the stretch or takes a pause reflects and um considers the possibility that there are changes for him to make on the way in as well and without a whole lot of practice time after the break and before that density of games uh, take hold. I'm not sure what revolutionary changes are are on tap uh, from him, other than hoping that it's a motivational thing. It's a pause. It's a refresh. It's an everybody shows up knowing what the stakes are and are willing to to play. Um, and then a continuing to hold people accountable. I, I know some folks have talked about Shifley's minutes at the ends of games and where there have been defensive issues or what have you going down. Well, that's the only area of extreme available left i don't think we're going to see wildly different strategies or systems i don't think we're going to see anything flip on its head um but you know as he has nothing to lose and gets desperate in an attempt to pull off uh, a return to the playoffs you might see dubois minutes go sky high you might see shifley suffer at times you might see a little bit more contextual stuff i'm not sure what other tricks he would have in his bag at this stage well and of course we'll uh, be very interesting to hear from the general manager kevin shovel Dayoff, who i believe hammer said was going to be speaking early next week and um you know i haven't heard from shovel Dayoff for a while 
Um, you know, he'll have some sleepless nights, I'm sure, right now during this break before the team gets back at it on the 8th of February. Hey, enjoy a few days off, my friend, and uh, have a great time during the break. We'll look forward to catching up real soon. Thanks so much, as always, for joining us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Hey, us. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. There he is. Uh, Murat Atash at WPG Murat. Make sure you check out that article I tweeted yesterday. A great mailbag piece from Murat as well in the uh, Athletic and at theathletic.com. Uh, Greg Wyshynski from ESPN is going to join us in just a couple of minutes. Um, it, it's freezing outside right now. I mean, maybe now you're needing a new battery for the car. Uh, it's If it's an ice block outside, you can't move it. Uh, Donnie and the gang at Manitoba Battery have got you covered. Uh, they're the premier stop for all your battery needs in Winnipeg and Manitoba. Most automotive batteries are priced for less than $100 with Core Exchange, or they'll deliver it to your door anywhere in Winnipeg for $115 on the same day you order, as long as you get your order in by 1.30 p.m. And, uh, you know, when things, you know, thaw out a little bit and people are getting out on the ice, Manitoba Battery has all the flasher batteries you need to keep you catching fish for the rest of the season. And of course, sled and snowmobiles as well. Go see Donnie and the gang at Manitoba Battery for all your battery needs. 1026 Logan, 783-8787 and online at manitobabattery.com. Um, Royal Sports, great supporters of ours from day one. Uh, they are your go-to spot for all your Jets merchandise. Tons of exclusives available over at Royal Sports. Uh, amazing selection of bomber gear, including many exclusive bomber championship merchandise pieces. And of course, the number one spot in the uh, city of Winnipeg for NFL gear. Still a few Bengals lids left. I saw some Rams, Tukes and jerseys that were flying out the store yesterday. Of course, all getting ready for the big game a week Sunday. And uh, if you're thinking hockey, um, nobody has a bigger selection of hockey equipment, skates, goalie gear as well than our friends at Royal Sports, not to mention snowboarding, fitness, and so much more. And make sure to check out all the cool stuff on the King's Skate, Snow, and Surf side over at 750 Pemina Highway. Hit them up on Insta, Royal Sports Pemina, for the latest merchandise drops and great deals over at Royal Sports. And as we're now into 2022, dealing with this Winnipeg winter, and the ups and downs of the hockey team, you might be thinking 2022 is time for a new whip. And if you're in the market for a new ride, before you do anything, talk to our friends over at Not Auto Corp, over at Waverly and McGillivray. Why not get into the car of your dreams at an amazing price with the help of the Not team? Uh, incredible vehicles on the lot. And if you're looking for a specific make and model, Not will source it, get it to Winnipeg for you, and get you the best deal possible. Not Auto Corp, Waverly and McGillivray and online at not.ca. All right, great conversation with our friend Murat Atesh. We will touch on the Jets, the All-Star Game, and much more as we welcome in Greg Wyshynski from ESPN. Wish, thanks so much for doing this. It's great to have you back on Winnipeg Sports Talk. How are you? It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, the, 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 we have a cantankerous bunch here in the peg right now. Um <laughs> One game above NHL 500 at the All-Star break. 40 games left in the season. We were doing the math here. The Jets pretty much need to go 24-11-5 or thereabouts to get into the playoffs. Um, there were very high hopes and big-time expectations for this team that's been spending to the cap, a lot of talent, great goaltender, added to the defense core. Um, what have you made of the Jets so far at the All-Star break? And are they the most disappointing team in the NHL so far this season? Well, I mean, the, the Islanders, Islanders exist, so no. Uh, <laughs> as far as that goes, uh, for those of us who picked the Islanders to win the Cup. Um, you know, obviously some injuries have played a role in the problems the Jets have had. Um, it's still a 20% chance of making the playoffs which ain't nothing to sneeze at. And it's uh, a conference where clearly both of the wild card spots, I think could be in play, uh, particularly for the central division when all is said and done. Um, but yeah, I think disappointing would obviously uh, characterize it. And, and, you know, there's been some unforeseen things. I mean, Paul Maurice stepping away from the team was not anything that we could have necessarily have predicted earlier this year. Um, and you know, it, it, it probably didn't help the team and knocked it off its access a little bit too.
some incredibly underwhelming losses, especially on home ice to some of the worst teams in the National Hockey League. Um, you know, and he took over on the 17th of December. They played Washington that night. You could tell they were a stunned club. But coming out of that, they actually, you know, beat the St. Louis Blues and then had a number of games canceled and started off the month of December or month of January, you know, with a few good performances. It seems like the last couple of weeks has really, really compounded problems. I mean, they got only two points on that four game road trip, really testing themselves against some of the top teams in the East and then came back with dismal performances against Florida and the Vancouver Canucks to uh, make it a six-game losing streak. Um, but when we're talking about the predicament that they had already gotten themselves in, Greg, um, you know, you just simply can't afford that. And, you know, now coming back on the other side, you're looking for a complete 180, a flip of the script. I mean, you know, being consistent for half the season to get it done. And... Um, Listen, there's a lot of people wondering how it got to that. Um, as far what are you hearing about Mark Shifley? There's a lot of talk about Shifley, his season so far this year. The numbers are down a little bit. Defensive numbers aren't good. He's been such an important player in Winnipeg, and maybe we focus on him more than others. But I mean, you've got a pretty good pulse on the league. I mean, uh, what do you make of uh, what do you make of uh, you know the Jets situation, particularly how it pertains to a guy that I think everyone thought was going to be the franchise player in Winnipeg for a long, long time. Yeah, I don't, I didn't, I've not really heard all that much, to be honest with you, from people about Shifley and like the crushing disappointment from his, of his season. I mean, when you start talking to people about players that have had down years, um, I think there's a general feeling of malaise about the way the Jets have played. I think if you ask around the league, there's probably more attention being given to Blake, Blake Wheeler than there has been to Shifley this year. Um, and just the preliminary conversations I've had about the team. Uh, but I can't, I can't say that I've, I've really come across too many people that are ringing alarm bells about, about Shifley and, and, uh, and his status. Yeah. It, it's interesting. It's this, the, um, I mean, Paul Maurice, I kind of made a joke. I mean, you know, earlier today, I mean, there was a time when Paul Maurice uh, literally said to the media that at some point they'd be building a statue of this guy outside the, uh, outside the arena. And we joked that the RFP on the Shifley statue is on hold right now. Uh, because to be honest, <laughs> to be honest, Greg, I mean, Pierre-Luc Dubois has been the guy that has emerged as the number one center yeah. right now. I mean, the line that yeah. is going for the Winnipeg Jets is Dubois and Connor. And right now they're getting some nice contributions from Cole Perfetti, who's really fitting in well. That yeah. was supposed to be the plan to success because if you've got those guys going, well, then you got Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler and whoever they're playing with. That's a great one-two punch. It just hasn't happened. And we rarely see both of those lines going on the same night. I think Shifley's good. I've always thought he's good. I never really thought he was as good as, as some of the accolades he's received. Like, I feel like Mark Shifley has appeared on more top 50 player lists in this league without actually being a top 50 player. He must have really good agents and really good reps to keep getting him on these lists all the time. I think he's, he's a fabulous player, don't get me wrong. But um, the accolades sent his way were always a little bit heavier than I think his level of achievement would require. That makes sense. It does. That that being said, I mean, uh, you know, I know we focus a lot on Shife because of where he's at right now with his contract and everything. Um, it, it seems like people are waking up to just how good Kyle Connor is, and uh, he'll of course represent the Winnipeg Jets this uh, weekend in Vegas. Yeah, and I'm really bummed he's not representing the U.S. in Beijing because <laughs> it was like he was definitely counted among that collection of of young forwards that. Uh, might have really shifted the paradigm for Team USA in the Olympics had the NHL have gone. But we'll settle for for him being in, in Vegas. We, we we broke it on our show, The Drop, last night that he's going to take part in the fastest skater competition, which will be fun, uh, if not for uh, Kyle Connor, then for watching us, uh, what, us watching him keep up with the Kel McCars and the Connor McDavid's and the Dylan Larkins of the world. Um, but it's he's the type of player that you want in in the all-star game like the central division is a real interesting place for the all-star game because i think there's like seven guys that are first timers uh first or second timers and um you know no patrick Kane, no blake wheeler no nathan mckinnon you know no, not a lot of these names that we normally associate with the central division in the all-star game are going to be there so this infusion of Kyle Connor and, and Alex Dabrinkit, Nazem Kadri and Makar and Kaprizov, I think is going to be 
really advantageous for the entertainment value of the all-star game because there is an enthusiasm gap between your veteran guys and your younger guys sometimes. And, you know, the players that, that have been there four or five times, yeah, they like taking the trip. They like being with their families. They like, you know, getting to meet the sponsors and stuff, but they don't necessarily like approach the competition aspect of this thing with the same forever as guys that are only there for the first or second time. So I'm excited that he's part of this wave of central division uh, newbies that are going to, I think, make the all-star weekend pretty fun. Well, I mean, you mentioned, and you guys did, uh, you know, break it yesterday on the drop of the uh, the guys that were in the fastest skater. We sort of knew that Kyle Connor would be a part of it. I mean, to get Connor McDavid and Kale McCarr in that group, I mean, that is going to be must-see TV. What do you know about the rest of the skills competitions? I have to admit, I being a guy that likes to play cards and whatnot, I, I think that this <laughs> 21 and 22, the blackjack shooting competition looks really cool. I mean, not, what are we going to be seeing before we get to the three-on-three game? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a lot of fun as a guy who likes playing blackjack. And I just hope that the uh, players that are involved understand the, the rules of the game <laughs> before they start shooting pucks. Uh, I think that's where you're going to see some some of your uh, more uh, accomplished snipers. Your, maybe your Steven Stamkos is maybe your Austin Matthews is taking a part uh, in that um, competition. Um, I will tell you that Hardest Shot, which is one that... Uh, if not an event that everybody looks forward to, at least an event that has some history to it based on, you know, multiple wins for Chara and Weber and players like that. Uh, it took a hit today with Alex Ovechkin being out of the all-star game uh, due to entering the COVID protocols today for the Washington Capitol. He's not going to play tonight against Edmonton. He's also out of the all-star game. Uh, he was definitely a name in, in circulation for hardest shot, having won the event previously, I believe in 2018. So, not even sure who's going to be in that event now that Ovechkin's out of it, but it's a pretty wide open field. Um, but other than that, I mean, it, it's just going to be fun. I mean, one of the things they're, they're bringing back this year is the breakaway challenge, that trick chalk competition that we had where, you know, you had Brent Burns dressing up like Chewbacca and Johnny Gaudreau wanting to light his stick on fire and all this other stuff. They're bringing that back this year. And if nothing else, that's going to be a real fun event considering uh, how much young talent we have in the game and innovative talent. And also the, considering the fact that they're bringing in uh, Trevor Zegers from the Ducks specifically for this event so he can ply his trade. Yeah, Zegers will be must-see TV when we get to that as well. Hey, one of the really cool things that the NHL has done over the last few seasons has been bring in some of the top women's players. Um, you know, of course, there is the Olympic Games going on right now. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, what um, do they have many uh, of the women uh, participating or uh, being a part of the All-Star festivities? One of the Lamaru twins from the U.S. is going to be taking part in the event uh, where they're, they're on the uh, Bellagio Fountain. Uh, and trying to shoot pucks onto different platforms. Uh, she's scheduled to take part in that. And I think she might be also taking, doing some stuff during the skills competition inside the arena too. Not sure on that. But uh, that's the only women's hockey competitor I recall seeing listed for the event. Um, like you said, with it being an Olympic year and having your, you know, Poulans and your Hillary Knights and everybody else uh, engaged over in Beijing, it's kind of hard to... Uh, bring in the number of uh, women's players they've had in the past. Well, I did see, uh, and I think if you guys had this at ESPN, I mean, uh, Manon Riom, who, of course, we all remember being oh, the yeah. first woman <laughs> to ever play goal. I guess she's going to be a guest goalie. Is she actually going to be playing yeah, or just yeah. sort of a, a host of the event? Well, my, my mind my mind was with active players, but yeah, no, she's going to, she and uh, actor Wyatt Russell, who, if you're a, a, a fan of uh, the MCU, was like the bad Captain America in the Falcon of the Winter Soldier. Uh, and famously, the son of Kurt Russell is going to be uh, the other goalie. It's going to be her and Wyatt Russell as the goalies for the breakaway challenge this year. Uh, Greg Wyshynski of ESPN with us. So I uh, wish we're at the break. Let's talk about the good so far this season. Um, is, is there a team that has impressed you m more than others compared to what your preseason expectations uh, have been so far at this point? Um, I would say all three California teams, specifically the Ducks, because I think a lot of us just assumed that they were going to be the de facto last place team in that division. Um, Zegris, Drysdale, Infusion of Youth, a lot of guys in that roster punching above their weight. Um, but I have to say that that I think they and the Sharks are both going to maybe fade a little bit. Whereas the LA Kings aren't, I'm, 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 I'm in on the, on the Kings a little bit. Uh, their underlying numbers are very strong. 
And the fact that it's kind of been the veterans leading the way. Like, if you told me the, the Kings were going to be in a playoff position to this point in the season, I would have said that Quentin Byfield and Alex Turcotte and, and uh, all the young players they've had in that pipeline clearly made a huge impact. And that, and that hasn't necessarily been the case. It's been, you know, Kopitar and uh, Arvidsson and Jonathan Quick having this resurrection of a season, uh, all sort of deciding simultaneously that they were tired of being irrelevant <laughs> and challenging for a playoff spot again. So I, I've been really impressed with the way they've played and I think it's sustainable based on the numbers that I've seen beyond the traditional stats. You know, when you look at the top of the East, I mean, there's sort of three teams that really stand out. Although credit to the Toronto Maple Leafs, they've had a great season so far. We'll wait to see what happens come postseason time for the Buds. Uh, but Tampa sets the bar. Um, who, in your opinion, is a bigger threat to the Lightning coming out of the East? Is it the Panthers or is it the Carolina Hurricanes? I, I mean... From a total team perspective, the, the Hurricanes are probably the better team than Florida, only because we know when tasked, they can play a playoff quality defense, um, which is something that we just don't know from the Panthers yet. Uh, we know they can win a game eight to six, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's great. Like, keep doing that. But inevitably, that's not going to be the way that they're going to have to play in the playoffs. And, you know, part of the reason the Lightning won consecutive cups was that change in, in philosophy that John Cooper really worked hard to instill in them in that it's great that you can put a bunch of goals on the board and be a, a huge intimidating offensive team, which I think the Panthers are right now, quite frankly. But if you don't know how to win the close game in the playoffs and, and don't have it in you to be able to, I mean, like, for example, the Lightning won a game seven against the Islanders, won nothing. Like, could you picture the Florida Panthers winning a one nothing game in the playoffs right now? Because I can't. <laughs> Great um, point. <laughs> you you, you got to be able to do that, too. And and I wonder if the Panthers have that ability, because I know I know the Hurricanes do. You know, uh, you know, and we spent so much time obsessing over the Central Division and the Jets and paying attention to the West. Um, if people haven't been paying attention, the playoffs are basically set right now in the East. I mean, at, yeah. at the, I mean, yeah. the Boston it, Bruins are in the eighth <laughs> spot right now. They've got 55 yeah. points. They've got a nine-point lead on the Red Wings, the next team up, with three games in hand. The fact that it is all but done, how do you think that might affect the final 40-odd games in the Eastern Conference? Well, it's interesting because, I, I mean, there is going to be some jockeying for position, um, and and I think home ice is going to be at a premium this season, obviously. So I do think that we're going to see intensity from these teams. I mean, you know, if you're the Toronto Maple Leafs and you can dictate who you play in the first round, um, you're going to try to do that as best you can to increase your chances. I, the, we mentioned the Islanders before. They're the only team that I think has a shot at all of making any kind of run for a wild card. And, and time's running short. But they've, they've not played as many games as other teams. And if you look around the league at teams that when they're locked in and when they're playing their game uh, could reel off a 12 game stretch where they get points in all 12 games. It's, it's the Islanders, right? Like, but we've, we've not seen that from them at all this season on a consistent basis. The, you know, winning the two nothing game and relying on Sorokin and getting the goals when they need them. Like they've just been kind of a mess. And every time they seem like they're going to take one step forward, they stumble back four steps. And so I'm hoping that they've got a run in them just to make the East a, a, a scintilla more interesting than it is, but I, I'm not holding out hope. You mentioned the Islanders, and we talked about the Jets kind of underperforming what the expectations were, and I don't want to pour salt in the wounds of everyone that is in the chat right now still bitter that the Jets lost to the Philadelphia Flyers last night, their first regulation win <laughs> in 2022 after their first entire win of the year was on the weekend. But um, what's happened in Philly? And I mean... I don't think Mike Yo, after a 13-game losing streak, is probably going to be back. So you know that there'll be a new a new coach. But I'd imagine heading into the deadline, considering where they are, Chuck Fletcher will be one of the more fascinating general managers to pay attention to. And we could have some long-serving flyers, maybe beginning with Claude Giroux, in new uh, new locales by the time we get to the month of April in the playoffs. Yeah, and that'll be up to Drew. He's got a full no move. Um, he's a UFA after the season. So there's speculation that, hey, he might want to move over and play for a contender, but he's going to be in complete control of that. Um, the Flyers are a curious team. Uh, 
I don't think they necessarily got the performance out of Carter Hart on a consistent basis that they wanted to this season. They were hoping for a, a real bounce back from him. And he, he was better than last year, but that's because last year was an abject disaster. Um, they they were impacted by some uh, absences in their lineup. Um, in particular, one that I thought could solve a lot of problems for them in Ryan Ellis, who uh, Chuck Fletcher acquired in that deal that uh, had Nolan Patrick ending up with the Vegas Golden Knights, um, he's not played, right? So like, he's played four games. The whole point of getting him, the whole point of getting him was, uh, is they were going to fix the problem that was created when Matt Niskanen retired. Remember when he retired? It seems like it was seven years ago, but it was only two seasons ago, and he left this gigantic hole on their defense. And they bought an Ellis to to plug that hole and and hopefully kind of just like stabilize everything. And then he he didn't play, uh, so that stunk. But the other moves that Chuck made were actually pretty good. Like Martin Jones has been pretty good for them. Uh, Cam Atkinson's been great for them. Um, so it wasn't a total bust, but the parts just don't seem to fit very well. And, and it's going to be really interesting to see what the next steps are for that franchise. Wish pull out your crystal ball. Um, what's next for Patrick Liney at the end of this season? Oh, I think he stays in Columbus. I, I, I just get a sense that um, because I talked to him for a feature story uh, last month and I get the sense that he he's grown to like it there. And, um, you know, I just feel like that guy wants a, a home. You know, that guy wants to feel wanted. Uh, I think that he does there, maybe. Um, but I also think that that's a team that makes that Dubois trade with the notion of Line is going to be a pillar for this franchise, along with Zach Wierenski, along with Merz Lickens, into whatever the next phase of this team is going to be. Craig Wyshynski of ESPN with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Um, I, the Avalanche have been the uh, it's kind of set in the bar right now. We all expected them to be a big time, if not the Stanley Cup contender, certainly the top team in the West. Um, once we get well, it's the dust settles post trade deadline. Is it the Vegas Golden Knights that you think will be the biggest challenge or biggest hurdle for Colorado to represent the West in the Cup final? Or is there another team potentially in the Central that you think might um, pose the biggest hurdle for the Avs? It's four of them. I, I think the, the Knights with Eichel um, are going to be really fascinating to watch it because not only is it them acqu- like acquiring the best player that any pl- team will acquire by the trade deadline. Like there's nobody in Jack Eichel's class going anywhere else at the trade deadline. Um, it also gives them center depth that few teams in this league can match. When you think about the emergence of Chandler C- Stevenson. Um, and when you think about what we already have in William Carlson, who I always thought was a quintessential second line center anyway, with the way he plays in his two way game. So they're going to be real good. The other teams, though, that I think are really interesting are the Minnesota Wild, who um, have really shown an ability to take over games and and certainly have the offensive prowess to hang with most and have been a an accomplished defensive team for at least the last three seasons. Um, the problem is, is they don't have the goaltending. This is the second straight season where their even strength analytics have been amongst the best when it comes to team defense but their goaltending has not played up to the same level. So that is a concern. The other team are the Blues, um, speaking of goaltending. Uh, they are they're more, probably my most interesting team in the West right now because if you had told me that the St. Louis Blues would be like an offensive juggernaut and they're like been in the top five in goal scoring per game for most of the season, I, I wouldn't have believed you. But the transformative effect of Jordan Cairo having his breakout year plus the acquisitions of Pavel Busnevich and Brandon Saad, plus uh, Vladimir Tarasenko finding his game again for the most part. All these things add up to them being a really, really good offensive team. On top of what we know about them defensively, the only concern, again, is if Jordan Bennington continues a losing streak in the playoffs that has now reached nine straight games, is Billy Huso good enough to be the alternate and, and take over in the crease? And he's shown... A lot of that this season so far, but the playoffs are a different animal, and that's my concern for them. 
Yeah, we got a chance to see Huso play on uh, on Saturday, and certainly, you know, doing the pregame show with the guys over on OB. You look at the numbers and the difference between what Bennington had done so far this year and Huso, and it really stood out. Yeah. And frankly, it was surprising that you know the Blues were where they were, considering a pretty mediocre season uh, from Bennington so far. But um, man, top to bottom, I mean, center depth from one to four. I mean, they run four lines. Um, they will be a handful for anybody in the playoffs. Hey, Wish, before we go, a lot of talk about the Edmonton Oilers who seem like they bottomed out a couple weeks ago. They've won a few <laughs> games, and they've added our old buddy Evander Kane to the mix. Uh, <laughs> have they uh, Have they righted the ship there? And um, how much of an asset do you think, at least in the short term, will Evander Kane be for an Edmonton team that was amongst the most desperate in the league just a couple weeks ago? Well, I can't say they righted the ship because they sunk my four-team parlay the other night by losing to Against Ottawa the in overtime. Ah. So that that hurt real bad. <laughs> uh, that, that was the one I was least worried about in the bet, but uh, things happen. Um, you know, there. I've always thought that the panic in Edmonton um, from the media and from the fans was a little misplaced. I thought they were going to be okay. Like maybe they're not built to be a champion. But Connor and Leon have dragged worse versions of this team to the playoffs. Um, it's still, for all of the baffling things that Ken Holland does, and maybe you could put the Evander Kane thing in there, even though I think he's he's fine for the rest of the season. I just wouldn't have him around in the offseason. Um, sitting on the sidelines while the goalie carousel span, span around in the NHL during the offseason and coming and running back with Mike Smith and 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 uh, Kostinen is just nuts to me. Like I, I just I don't understand it. Um, it didn't make any sense then. It makes less sense now that we see what the goaltending for this team is. Um, and so I think they're good enough to get in. I, I still do. I think I think the, the I, I even might say that they'll finish ahead of Calgary in that division. But um, but you know. Bottoming out is probably the right term for what happened to them recently because it was real bad. Well, it was. And I mean, you could see the smoke from Winnipeg with what was going on in the uh, building. And now, frankly, <laughs> that's um, that's just come here right now. They've won some games and now all that panic and chaos seemingly. The, the uh, wind, right. winds shifted. The winds blew it all over to your <laughs> Manitoba. Exactly. Uh, but just last one for you. I mean, if Kane goes and, and produces like most people expect that he will and doesn't get in any trouble. Will there be an NHL team in the offseason that has a significant offer for Kane on a deal beyond one year in your mind? Ooh, I yeah, but maybe just two years. Like, I don't think he's getting another long-term contract out of anybody because of the situation that happened in San Jose. Uh, as as we've seen from, from Edmonton and, and Washington, apparently was in the business too, there are going to be teams that are they are going to want Evander Kane on their roster. Um, and he's going to bet when he's done with Edmonton this year. Um, there'll be teams that want him. Maybe it'll take a third uh, sit-down interview with a female journalist to clear <laughs> his name. We've already gotten two this year. Uh, maybe we can go for the hat trick, and then someone will like want him on their team. But uh, but there's always going to be a home for someone that could potentially score 30 goals in this Wish, league. always appreciate your time. Thanks so much for doing this uh, with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Uh, just quickly, what do you and the ESPN gang have coming up for uh, All-Star Weekend in Vegas? Oh, God. I mean, I leave for Vegas tonight. It's going to be huge. We have coverage of of all the, 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 the skills and the All-Star game on ESPN. So, I mean, expect innovation. Expect a ton of different voices. Uh, expect... Uh, a lot of fun. I mean, I, I could tell you from, from being in the company and and, uh, and and working now for this year with the rights that we've targeted the All-Star Game as kind of our launch for the rest of the coverage this year. And so it's going to be it's going to be really, really fun to see how uh, we bring this event uh, in a new light. Any chance we'll see you rise out of the fountains of the Bellagio in the midst of the ESPN <laughs> coverage or anything cool like that? <laughs> There's a better chance uh, you'll find me uh, uh, completely inebriated clutching one of the playing cards uh, in the middle of Las Vegas Boulevard. 
I think would be the better bet. <laughs> hey, well, I'll tell you what. It sounds like it's going to be a real fun weekend. Thanks so much. Have a great time in Vegas and uh, looking forward to seeing what you and the ESPN team has for uh, hockey fans over the course of these next few days. Je- Wish, thanks for doing this. You got it. Thanks for having me. There he is. The uh, man at Wyshynski. There's Greg Wyshynski of ESPN. Uh, we're going to get to some football. Big signing for the Bombers. Crazy stuff happening down in the National Football League. Uh, Before we do that, a big cheers to our friends over at Little Brown Jug, our official beer sponsor, producing Winnipeg's finest local brews for five years running. Of course, they did the uh, big anniversary Brute IPA in December, the flagship 1919 brand available at beer stores and restaurants around the city. And right now, a great way to maybe get through these really cold days the winter variety pack from Little Brown Jug. You can pick it up at your local beer store, pop by the tap room on William Avenue, open between 3 and 9 p.m. And if you don't want to leave the house, and I don't blame you, hit them up online at littlebrownjug.ca for delivery citywide. Uh, Lots going on out at the Scotties. Let's do a quick Princess Auto curling report uh, because... We've got a lot of Manitoba content right now. The wild card flurry rink still without Tracy flurry lost their first game. They've rattled off five games in a row and they are tied at the top of pool a with the team from new Brunswick. And over on the other side, it has been all team Canada, Carrie Anderson, her Gimli rink six and oh, so far, um, but a little tougher times. Another loss for Mackenzie Zacharias representing Manitoba. They are three and two right now in uh, a dogfight with a lot of teams in Pool B, but it certainly does look like Carrie Anderson and her Gimli rink will be the top of the table at the end of the first uh, round robin. Of course, Curly in the Olympics gets going tonight on the mix side with Holman and Morris. And of course, uh, we've got Jen Jones, proudly sponsored by Princess Auto, going for gold as well. Uh, Princess Auto is where you'll find the best deals and the most unique and assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Check out one of their two local locations or shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. And we will get to the big game tonight. Canada and El Salvador is our World Cup push continues. Might be a great night if you're heading out to get down to your local Boston pizza and watch the game with some friends. And if you're not heading to BP, you can get those famous wings, gourmet pizzas, and more delivered to you by hitting them up at bostonpizza.com. Check out those game day specials and get it hot, fast, and ready to your door. All right, let's move on from the pucks and talk a little pigskin right now with Justin Dunk of Three Down Nation. JD, what's going on? How are you? Trying to keep up with all of it, my man. I'm doing well. What about you, Hustler? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, Bomber fans are happy right now. Uh, hockey fans around here are a little freaked out right now where the team is going into the All-Star break. But um, it sure has been a wild few weeks for Kyle Walters. I uh, joked on Dustin Nielsen's show last week that they should start playing Enter Sandman when he comes out because the guy's been closing deals like Mariano Rivera. Uh, and another big one today broken by you, Rashid Bailey coming back. Sort of the first piece on the receiving core after another uh, uh, a number of other areas were prioritized first for Kyle Walters to get some of their big all-stars back. A key one getting Bailey back. Showtime sheet, as he's known to the fans out there. Hype and energy he certainly brings to that locker room. But the reason that it's so important is because Kenny Lawler has a $250,000 offer on the table from the BC Lions. So you have to all but assume that Lawler's going to take the money unless the Bombers somehow find a way to get to that number. I don't think it's possible because of what they've done and going along here and keeping a good core and group of this team that has gone back to back together. So if Lawler leaves, Bailey could potentially step into that number one role. He really developed a rapport with Zach Caleros, who's now the highest paid player in the league at $550,000. So they had to bump up Caleros and that's probably why Lawler will leave. But you give Caleros a guy that he has some trust in, in Bailey. And you never know what the Bombers could have up their sleeve in terms of that receiving court. Well, and, 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 you know, I think we've seen in the past that, you know, the receiving core, much like the DBs, I mean, heck, the Bombers had no DBs going into last year's camp and famously brought in 30 or 35 guys to essentially try out and pick the best ones. Uh, and they picked out a few gems. I mean, in Alford and uh, in Nichols, of course, Alford's now in the National Football League waiting to see what's up with Nichols. But Winston Rose is back. He resigned yesterday. Another big, big piece for the Bombers. 
Um, but it will be interesting, that receiving core, how different it looks. I mean, Wolitarski's back, Sheed's back. Um, but, I mean, if you lose Kenny Lawler, Darvin Adams is still a free agent right now. I mean, of course, Nick Dembski, a huge part of that club that you would think would be back as a local guy. Um, there would be the potential, if you're looking for some changes on that championship roster from last year, might be an opening or two at the wide out position. There could be, and it could be a similar situation in terms of what you laid out with the defensive backs with the receivers in 2022. So I do get the sense that there is an appetite for Nick Dembski to want to be back there. Of course, he's from Winnipeg, won back-to-back Grey Cups, wants to continue to cement his legacy in the city, but the number value is going to have to be right. As far as Darvin Adams goes, there's varying opinions around him in the league some people really believe like he's a piece that can fit into your offense because of what he does blocking even though he didn't make a ton of spectacular plays in the passing game but he's a reliable guy Caleros knows that if he sees zone Arvins is gonna or Adams is gonna sit down in it and if he sees man he can put the football up and Adams will go compete for it but it's also a spot where the Bombers could potentially look to save some money and use it elsewhere to re-sign some of these other guys that they've gone after and go bring in a group of, I don't know if they'll bring in 30 or 35 receivers like the DBs they brought in last year, but bring in a group of younger receivers to see what they could have and pay them a lesser rate. Like for example, Rasheed Bailey only made $69,000 last year. So he gets his bump up, but if you go find the next guy there and bring him along with Caleros, then you can help out that defense and, sign some of the guys that they brought back, like you mentioned, a Winston Rose. Well, uh, you know, big picture. I mean, how impressed have you been with what the Bombers as an organization and Kyle Walters have been able to do? Because, I mean, I, honestly, we knew guys like to be a part of this team and they have a special bond with the city and the fans. But when you win back-to-back championships, a lot of guys deserve raises right off the bat. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have seen a number of players decide to forego the opportunity to go to the highest bidder to stay here in Winnipeg. It's some of the most important players that we knew were leaving money on the table. Very impressive. And I think certainly, as you're alluding to, the culture plays into that. What Michael Shea and Kyle Walters and Wade Miller have developed there in that locker room is really special, in particular O'Shea. And in my mind, a large part of the reason why these players have left some money on the table elsewhere, like let's say Jamarcus Hardrick, for example, he flat out said it. Does he want to leave Winnipeg for maybe $10,000, $15,000 more, or would he rather stay there go for a third straight great cup and know that if you keep the t- core of that team together, you're at least going to get one playoff bonus check. So that was what Calgary had going for them for years as to why guys would take less. And in my mind, that's what's happening with Winnipeg. The Lawler situation is totally on its own because some people felt like yeah, he might get in that 190000 to $200,000 range in terms of the contract offers, but nobody anticipated $250,000. So if you're going to leave for $50,000 more, then yeah, that makes some sense for you to go and get that cash because you're probably not going to be able to recoup it in Winnipeg, but there still might be some creative ways to get that back. But by and large part for every other player, if they're going to leave for ten or 15000 or have the chance to compete for a cup and be back in that locker room with O'Shea, it makes sense for their career and their legacy there to come back and go for it again. Yeah, and by the way, I should mention that Dembski does have another year on his deal, so I mean, that's probably why we haven't been uh, obsessing about him right now, knowing that he'd be in. But the opportunity for, like, if Kenny Lawler does leave, you mentioned Rashid Bailey. I mean, he would be a guy that would certainly be in the mix to step up and see even more balls. Dembski, I mean, does so many different things, both from uh, a passing and a running view. Um, But Darvin Adams is the other interesting player. I know he's on your top available receivers heading into free agency, over at Three Down Nation. I mean, Darvin has sort of been the the good soldier the last couple of years. He was the number one receiver on a team that, you know, famously went from Matt Nichols to Chris Streveler to Zach Kolaris in the final game. And the Bombers were a unicorn. I mean, they did all their damage on the ground. There wasn't a lot of balls for the receivers. Um, and even in a quiet year last year, when it counted the most, Darvin Adams was big in the playoffs. Um, how do you see the Darvin Adams uh, situation shaking out? And uh, do you, do you, is it likely he'll be back or is he a guy that, you know, will probably go and, you know, see what the other member clubs of the CFL might have for him come free agency? 
it's totally going to depend on the number, I think, as it does in a lot of ways. But if it's close, then he would potentially be back in Winnipeg. But I know for sure that Paul Apelis would like him in Ottawa with the Red Blacks to provide some veteran leadership and also that blocking capability that he has. Like, he gets after it. That's underrated. It's not really sexy if you're a receiver to be talked about in that way. But he's an all-around dude, has a lot of experience in this league. So I think certainly – that's to be decided as to whether Adams will be back in Winnipeg or elsewhere in 22. Um, as far as the the rest of the uh, the available receivers, uh, I mean, I'm still stunned at the money that Lucky Whitehead got, and we've heard about the offer apparently to Kenny Lawler. What's that going to do to the market? Do you think about some of the other top guys that you know, frankly, have longer, more established careers than both of those guys in the Canadian Football League? Timing really plays a role in so much of this. So in my mind, it helps out Duke Williams because he's going to be able to sit there, whether it's the Rough Riders or another competing team and say, hey, at minimum, just to get in my ballpark, we're talking over $200,000 now. And in my mind, if I had to choose between the two, and this is no disrespect to Kenny Lawler, I'd rather have Duke Williams. So I think Williams can sit there and say, hey, 250 k if Lawler's got that offer on the table, I deserve that. And he's got the resume with over 1,500 yards in 2018, leading the league in receiving to say he deserves it and has done some things in the NFL. But Lawler led the CFL in receiving as well. So I think it certainly helps out Williams. But some of the other guys on that list, like a Darrell Walker, who was at that level, made $275,000 when he was with the Argos in 2019. But then it was like he fell off a cliff last year now a lot of that could have had to do with Jamie Elizondo and the offense not fitting him and Trevor Harris maybe not developing that connection with him like they thought they could at the start of the season because it does take time it's no slight at either one of them but it just takes time that Walker's not necessarily going to command that money Greg Ellingson another intriguing name that's out there that could be had for I would say less than two hundred thousand dollars so even though their resumes are longer they're not necessarily as sexy as Lawler or Duke Williams right now we're going to see Brandon Banks back in the three down game this year. That I could certainly see. There's interest in Banks. A lot of people are trying to gauge the market on Banks because they don't want to overpay for him because they're a little bit hesitant based on what he did in 2021 that he might have lost a step. And even Banks, you know, talking to him through the season, admitted that he thought he wasn't quite the same speedy B like he was in 2019. But I think he still got that explosive ability. We saw a different Banks in my mind in the playoffs. So. I could certainly see him playing and helping a team in a number of ways. Remember, he was a dynamic returner before he was a thousand yard receiver at an all-star caliber in this level as well. So I certainly get the sense there's a good chance we'll see Banks in the CFL in 22. Justin Dunk from Three Down Nations with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Um, where does the car- uh, quarterback carousel end, in particular for former Ticat Jeremiah Masoli? Ooh, well, there's a bidding war heating up there between the Red Blacks and the Elks. Now, Chris Jones gave Nick Arbuckle $100,000, but it wasn't necessarily his choice. There was a, quote, contract in the drawer or a handshake agreement with Edmonton when Arbuckle was traded for by former GM Brock Sunderland that he had to get that $100,000 and credit the team for honoring it. But in Jones's mind, it's like that doesn't even exist. He wants to go after Masoli get a veteran quarterback there. I've been told that Jones isn't necessarily a Trevor Harris guy. So I think he really wants to get Masoli. And that's where Masoli started his career, was in Edmonton. Yes, we know him from being with the Ticats, but he was first brought into the league by the green and gold. The Red Blacks are going to have something to say about that, though. They really want Masoli. Sean Burke, the GM there in Ottawa, has a relationship with Masoli from their time together in Hamilton. Burke was there for the entire time that Masoli was in Tiger Town, signed him to multiple contracts there as well. So they have a trusted relationship. And I really think now that there's two teams competing, that's what's going to drive the price up. In my mind, $400,000 is just the starting price to get Masoli. And the fact that there's two teams competing now, that's why we have a bidding war. So we'll see how high it goes. Caleros is the highest paid player in the league, highest paid quarterback at 550000 The next tier of that is Bo Levi Mitchell and Cody Fajardo, who have a chance to make 485000 because they have some playtime incentives in their contract. So if I'm a solely, I'm sitting there saying, hey, I'm more proven than Dane Evans. I have more wins than Vernon Adams Jr., who's due to make about $450,000. So you want to start bringing out the comparables, then it's easy to see why he could get up into that you know, four and a half, you know, getting close to that $500,000 range. So those are the two teams that I see 
really in the mix to get Masoli. Uh, Dunk, uh, what's Paul Lapolis going to be left with right now? I mean, you know, we knew he went in, he wanted to be a head coach again. He got that opportunity, and I don't think he got any support from the organization or general manager. We knew he was going into last season with a roster that uh, just simply was clearly at the bottom of the Canadian Football League. Can Ottawa fans expect any sort of a turnaround? And how aggressive do you think that they'll be once free agency officially begins? Yeah, to be fair, Lapolis did make a number of those decisions himself, right? There were people in Ottawa that didn't want Timothy Flanders to start. So the fact that he continued to run him out there really rubs some people in the front office the wrong way. So I think what's going to happen now is Burke is going to have more of a say over that roster and who's there. And they're certainly going to try to be aggressive. But as a lot of players resign that they would have wanted to have a shot at, then it takes those options down. But I certainly think we can see an infusion of playmakers there. And some of the guys we've talked about a little bit, like Lapolis would want Adams there. But you look at some of the other guys who could be available, you know, if they don't get Masoli, Plan B for them would be Trevor Harris. And if you bring Trevor Harris, we know who he's tight with, the jelly man, Greg Ellingson. So you could have those guys back in Ottawa if it plays out a certain way. You would imagine a guy like William Powell could be in the mix, who was so dynamic there for Ottawa. And you go down that list of receivers, which is deeper than some people think that it is, then I really think that there will be a different-looking Ottawa offense and the defense as well for lap least to be able to coach with in 22. Uh, when you look ahead to free agency, uh, what team intrigues you the most? And I mean, I know we've talked about some of the big offensive players is a player that we haven't mentioned that you think will be an incredibly high demand. Once uh, the bidding begins. Ooh, Ooh, that's interesting. The team that intrigues me the most, to be honest, is Ottawa because they have money to spend. That's not tied up. And I think Edmonton, does as well, but we're already getting a sense what BC is doing because Nathan Rourke, the Canadian starting quarterback, is on a team-friendly contract of $80,000 for 2022. They're going out and trying to spend big to get Lawler there, and I think they're going to try to add some other pieces, maybe on the O-line or the defense to improve, but the Red Blacks intrigue me because the East Division, in my mind, sets up as a much easier way to get turned around there quicker and they have money to spend like they don't have a lot invested in the players that are already on the roster so I think that the Red Blacks can be aggressive and in terms of a game-changing player the guy that a lot of teams would have wanted to have a shot at was Jagera Davis but the Argos have stepped up in this negotiating window and put a contract proposal on the table worth in and around two hundred thirty thousand dollars to steal him from the tie cats and bring him down the QEW to Toronto. That's an absolute game changer. Probably the next guy that I'm most intrigued about on defense. And you mentioned, we've talked a lot about the offense is Derek Moncrief. He's still out there. It's been pretty quiet, but I think it's safe to assume that he's either back in Edmonton with Jones, who brought him into the league with Saskatchewan, or he goes back to the rough riders because he has a strong connection with Jason Shriver as a defensive coordinator there. So that's a dude I think that can be a major disruptor. The other one, in my mind, would be Dylan Wynn. I don't think he played to his top level in 2021, but he has been an all-star in the past, was with the Tiger Cats for the last few years. I think he could be a guy that Burke looks at to bring to Ottawa or some other teams feel like he can be a disruption from the interior of the D-line. Now, uh, Justin, of course, your work is focused on the Canadian Football League at Three Down Nation, but I've got to ask you about the huge story coming out of the Four Down game. I mean, we're a week away from the Super Bowl. Tom Brady was retiring, and now that is all on the back page because of this class action lawsuit brought by former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores. Uh, it includes Bill Belichick screwing up technology and texting the wrong guy. Uh, it involves allegations that... Uh, the Broncos management, including John Elway, were hung over when they came in for a uh, for his interview. But maybe most damning, outside of the, the accusations of uh, racial prejudice against black coaches, is that the Miami Dolphins owner was offering their head coach $100,000 per loss to tank the season. Um, there's a lot to unwrap from all this, but I mean, what did you make when you first heard the story and how do you think this goes from here when it comes to Flores and the ripple effects it'll have for a number of NFL clubs? Yeah, to be honest, you know, I'm going to take sort of the news approach here, but I really do feel like 
Flores in his career as a coach are probably done. Hopefully not, but he's making a stand here that probably a lot of other people, people of color, were afraid to do because they didn't want to put their career on the line. So at bottom line, you at least have to commend Flores for that. As to the follow, we've seen statements from the organizations named in the class action lawsuits, and they're going to defend this to the fullest ability, right? We've already seen the Broncos come out and say, no, hey, we had the meeting there. We were there on time at 730. I believe they said it went the full allotted time of three and a half hours. So they're going to fight this to their fullest ability. But what I hope happens out of this is meaningful change. And it would be great to have the steps laid out to get there or see it actually happen. Like you have a league that has more people of color in it playing on the field than it does people that look like us. So you need that representation in coaching and in the front office. So I think these guys should be getting legitimate opportunities and women as well in those positions. You know, we've seen so much talk about women, especially in the NFL and the prevalence of it of late and it's growing, but we need to make sure we're doing the same thing or the NFL does in terms of the people of color and Flores is making a stand and full credit to him. From a Dolphins perspective, um, I mean, like, you know, there's a couple things. I mean, hey, they hired him. He was their guy. Um, so, I mean, it, it's sort of a different topic. But um, if it is found to be true that Stephen Ross was, you know, offering bonuses for losing games, I mean, how, how many, like, can he still own the team? What does that do to the, uh, I know I think they plan to have a couple big draft picks coming up. I mean, I would imagine the potential for them losing some of those picks is on the table. I mean, this could be a nuclear bomb within the Miami Dolphins organization, I think. That's going to warrant a full investigation, in my mind, from the NFL. They at least have to look into that. And if you look at what happened in the past in terms of some of the investigations they had, like a deflate gate and the discipline that was handed down, that something where you're trying to lose games and you're putting money on the line, like we saw with Bounty Gate with the New Orleans Saints, like that penalty is going to be harsh because it takes away – from the competitiveness of the game and the respect that the NFL deserves. And also you look at the betting aspect that's become so big, you know, this hustler, right? That if you have somebody that's putting money on the table, the owner, anybody else for you to lose games. But the fact that this is the owner is a major underlying story in this class action lawsuit. Yeah. Hugh Jackson also mentioned today that he was offered money to lose games. And uh, well, I, I saw a tweet that said, Hey, if you're good at, if you're good at something, get paid for it. And uh, nobody was, nobody was better at losing <laughs> games during his tenure than that, than old Hugh Jackson. Uh, hey, quickly, before we go, what do you think of the, uh, the matchup of uh, Bengals and Rams for a week Sunday? No, it's tasty, man. You got Joe cool Burrow on the LA stage. And of course the Rams there at SoFi in my mind, the Rams being there or the Chargers being there was a perfect scenario for the NFL. So they get the Rams in the game. You can really hype it up in that area. And I'm sure all the stars will be out like there are most Super Bowls. But I think it'll be different because it's in La La Land. But I'm just so curious to see what Burrow can do because it just seems like nothing is able to get under this guy's skin. He's unflappable, ice cold. Everybody thought the game was over in Kansas City. But – I got to remind people out there, and I hate saying this, but we live in this Twitter age where we like to react to every single play. Football is a 60 minute game. All right. Can we just, and I hate it's a cliche, but can we just remember that when we're watching these games that just because it's 21 3 and the Chiefs look like they're in control, there's still 30 minutes of football to be played. Okay. And Burrow proved that, and we've seen that multiple times, right? Everybody thought that the Bills were going to beat the Chiefs, and yes, 13 seconds, and there was all these errors. But football is 60 minutes. Let's let the game breathe a little bit and play out. That said, I am intrigued to see what Burrow can do in L.A. Now, it should be a good one. Uh, Justin, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I know very busy for you guys over at Three Down. Uh, fill people in on uh, what you guys have coming up over the next few days and, of course, for CFL Free Agency. Yeah, I first should say on the Dembski front that he is under contract for 2022, right? Huss, I think you said that. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that everybody out there is getting the proper info. I've already got a couple of texts about it. So... <laughs> I wanted to make sure that that's on point. So he will be back to go for the three P. As for what we got cooking at Three Down Nation, we have our top 30 of the most legit pending free agent list out there on the site. And then we're going to rank every single position. Everybody seems to like the ranking. So we've got the quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, 
out there and then we'll go all the way through it you know offensive line specialists and of course all the defensive positions and then literally and there's the receivers right there all of the latest news will be up on three down nation hot fresh and ready for everybody to check out so It'll be a busy time and a fun one, and we'll see where some of these big names land us. Hey, dude, appreciate you and all the work that you guys are doing. Uh, we'll definitely have to catch up when we get into free agency for the latest from around the Canadian football league. Keep up the great work, and uh, thanks for your time today. Thanks, man. You too. Keep it humming out there. You got it. Give him a follow on Twitter at jdunk12 and check out all of Justin's work, along with our pal John Hodge, covering the Canadian Football League at 3 Down Nation. Uh, we am going to give a big thanks to our friends over at the Nick and Nikki DQ group uh, Four locations in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba, the DQ in Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park and DQ St. Anne's. Of course, DQ St. Anne's now open year round, even when it's this cold and even better. You don't want to leave the house. You can uh, order on Skip the Dishes and Uber Eats and get it delivered directly to you. Check out the new Buffalo Chicken Fingers, the Ultimate Grill Burger french fries and more all those delicious ice cream novelties maybe mix in a blizzard and if you need a dq ice cream cake for an event you can go to any of the four nick and nicky dqs and get one ready to pick up or hit them up on instagram at dq manitoba and they'll get a custom made for you ready to pick up fast and easy at any of the four nick and nicky dq locations and of course friday is coming up soon we're getting a new uh, new shipment of Winnipeg Sports Talk Canadian Club hoodies for our winners. Still uh, got yours waiting for you, Eric. Um, and of course, February at all Manitoba Liquor Marts, look for the Canadian Club displays because original Canadian Club, Canadian Club uh, 100% rye and Canadian Club 12-year reserve all on sale for the month of February. And you can pick that up at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. All right, we're going to get to the cool bet lines in a minute, but let's get Michael Remus back in here because a number of things we need to talk about. Um, but Remo, I haven't had a chance to hear your thoughts on this Brian Flores lawsuit. I mean, really shaking the National Football League, and he was doing a media tour, a number of interviews today. Um, it's quite clear that Brian Flores is trying to make a significant change after feeling that, you know, he and many other Black coaching candidates have been uh, overlooked and not given a fair shot at some of these NFL jobs. Yeah, and we've been here wondering, like, why can't why can't uh, Eric Bieniemy get a job? He's been a coordinator for a while. You know, we had said Brian Flores is the number one candidate. After you know, why did he get fired from Miami? Well, when the owner tells you allegedly that he'll give you a hundred k to lose games and you start producing winning records. Uh, yeah, that would probably create um, a poor working environment. So uh, I think the shocking part, Huss, or not shocking, is Bill Belichick having, uh, texting the wrong Brian. Um, this is why on my phone, I have every person, I, every person full names. Um, you have first name, then last name. You do not want to be in a situation where you're just going by first names. You know how many like Adams or Andrews? I have on my phone. That's why I'm all first name, last name, never happening to me. I'm trying to think, did you ever have an issue where you texted the wrong person? Um, I didn't do this, but when uh, we bought a house, when my cousin thought he was texting my wife, but he texted another girl the same name saying, congratulations on buying a house before we even got to announce it. And then he did it again when my son was born, uh, letting then that news get get out to uh, non-family members before it uh, was, you know, appropriate. So uh, I'm going to dis- I'm going to give a tip. First name, last name on every contact, even even your your parents, if you want to do that, too. I don't know if you have your parents in as mom and dad or you got I might be a, the only psycho out there that has the, the first name and last name. Yeah, I, I have them in as mom and dad, actually. I just got just got one, so that's not a bit. But you know what? That's some veteran advice, too. And especially you know, over the years, you meet some people or you might meet, uh, you know, you might meet someone of the opposite sex and might not actually get into the last name. Put where you met them. Like, for instance, Jenny from BP or yeah. where they work. I mean, any, any sort of additional information mm-hmm. to avoid Bill Belichicking yourself. Um, definitely yes. helpful. That's, I mean, uh, people are missing what the story was. He texted Brian Flores congratulating on getting the Bills job three days before Brian Flores's, in, or sorry, the Bills, the Giants job, um, three days before his interview was scheduled. Uh, and then, you know, Flores responded, hey, thanks, coach. I think I have a pretty good chance for it. And then realized that 
he was texting Brian Dable, the offensive coordinator of the Bills, who apparently had already agreed to be the coach. And that was part of the complaint that, you know, this interview was a sham interview that they were uh, that they were setting up. If you're on the if you're on YouTube right Should now, do, you can you can do the it. reading. Yeah, sure. You can read it out. OK, or do you want me to be Bill and you can be Brian or you probably can't read it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bro, he says, yes, sounds like you've landed. Congrats. Did you hear something I didn't hear? Giants? Interview on Thursday. I think I have a shot at it. That's Brian Flores. Bill. Got it. I hear from Buffalo and Giants. You are their guy. Hope it works out for you too. Uh, here's Brian. That's definitely what I want. I hope you're the right coach. Thank you. And then and then he says, Coach, are you talking to Brian Flores or Brian Dable? Just making sure. And then Bill Belichick says, Sorry, I fucked this up. I double checked and I meant I misread the text. I think they are naming Dable. I'm sorry about that, BB. And I mean, that's to get that text before you even have the interview. Exactly. Uh, horrible. That's horrible. You know, and yeah, and to your point, anyone that was wondering if Bill Belichick mm -hmm. was sincere when he talked about, uh, um, what was it, uh, Facegram? Yeah, or, Snap uh, Face. Snap Face. Yeah, Snap Face. That was his thing. Yeah. Not really, uh, not really his thing. Um, so that obviously is a huge story in the world of sports. We'll be following that. That yeah. certainly will be continuing on. Uh, we got Olympics getting going tonight. Yes. Olympic Games curling tonight, seven o'clock. Holman and Morris, and our first game of the Olympic women's hockey tournament. Canada taking on Switzerland. And I saw on a sports book today, someone put this out that the Canadian women are minus thirty five thousand favorites oh my uh, god I've, I've never seen a line that big literally in any sport not even sure why they listed it but uh if you think the swiss might be able to pull off the shocking upset um you can bet five and you'll probably end up coming back with about a couple grand hey if the coyotes can win yesterday you never know you never know what can happen here us right isn't that the, the story <laughs> although no I, I am surprised they did list those odds like why would you even bother like what is it like a hundred dollars to win like 50 cents <laughs> pretty much pretty if that if that um you know well you bet 35 grand to win 100 so do the do the math back oh it up I mean, you're, you're basically talking about uh some crazy numbers uh, charles hamlin and marie philippe poulin have mm -hmm. been named flag bearers for the winter olympics and a quick baseball note reem jeff francis Named to the Canadian I, Baseball Hall of Fame class 2022. What a player he was. I had to throw that in there. I was a big Jeff Francis guy when he was on the Rockies. He was their guy for the when they went to the 07 World Series. You know, there weren't a ton of Canadian pitchers um, then. I know he, I think he was on World Baseball Classic. He was in the 2015 Pan Am Games. Loved, loved Jeff Francis. So I actually hadn't heard his name in so long, but he will be going into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame with the 2020 class. That didn't get inducted. Oh, we do have some uh, breaking of uh, another bomber signing, uh, Huss. Um, oh man, get the siren! Yeah, I'll get the. I'll throw <laughs> out the siren here. I'll I'll just bring it up right here. Here it is. Uh, they're throwing out on Twitter. They signed Mercy Mastin. Nice to a one-year deal. Uh, DB Mercy Mastin. I'll get the the horn. Hold on. Well, that's uh, that's big news. Um, certainly with the uh, departure of uh, Alford and the uh, status of Nichols being up. Kyle Walters does it again. Yes. Oh, wait, are, see, people are actually upset that I quoted Bill Belichick in there. I'm not putting the E or beeping it out. What? Yeah, don't worry. We're all good. Um, we're, anyways, all, we're all adults here. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Mercy Mastin back with the Blue Bombers. Rashid Bailey signed earlier today. And of course, Remo, for people that missed it earlier, Rashid Bailey joining mm. us live tomorrow. Uh, probably, I'd imagine he's probably back at home in Philly. Wonder if he was at the game last night. Not sure, but uh, we'll uh, we'll be talking to Showtime Sheed tomorrow. I'm so excited for this interview. If you follow him on Twitter, he honestly seems like the most dialed in, intense dude, maybe in football. I mean, he seems to be on 24-7 both as a football player and just in life. The guy gets after it. Rashid, yeah, he's also, friend, he's also friends uh, with some, well, Meek Mill, the rapper I see, yep. always tagging uh, Rashid 
Rashid Bailey. Uh, okay, people are just joking with me about uh, dropping the f bomb in chat. Don't joke with me. I, there's, you can't read sarcasm on the internet. Doesn't come through. <laughs> Does, doesn't come through. I was kind of rattled there, but I'm good hey, now. One other bomber note. Um, everyone's talking about this today. Uh, David Letterman. Oh yeah, spotted. So where was he? He was backstage at the Seth Meyers show. So it um, was yeah, but rocking a bomber Grey Cup championship too. Looking good. Yeah, I have a lot of questions about this. So he did Seth Meyers yesterday. I think 40th anniversary of him hosting late night. Cause you know, before uh, the late show us, he was on late night on NBC. There was the whole thing. How could we all, how could we forget? But this is the picture that's breaking the internet today. <laughs> David Letterman backstage uh, with the bombers champions hat and uh, CFL putting out the tweet. A lot of questions. How did he get, how did he get uh, the hat? Is he putting in an order on the Bombers website and typing in David Letterman or sending it to Montana? Is his assistant buying it for him? Was he giving it as a gift? We have a lot of questions, but I think Norm McDonald wearing a Jets hoodie was number one, but I think it might, it might have been passed by, uh, by Letterman. From Although this is totally unexpected. Norm McDonald's at least Canadian. Right, he's done shows here. Like what? Yeah, exactly. What connection? He's with our pal Bart. Yeah. He, he came by, yeah. and uh, you know, he uh, he you know loved Winnipeg, and he was always wearing that thing. Uh, Dave Letterman, uh, out of the blue, dropping a bomber Grey Cup championship toque was something that certainly caught a people a number of people's eyes, and now everyone's tweeting about it and talking about it. So, uh, hey, welcome to the uh, the Bomber Nation, oh. Dave. You picked a great team to back it up. Two two championships in a row, and they're going for three next season. Yeah, confirmed. Royal Sports says they he got it at Royal Sports. So yeah, yeah. if you want well, one, just like Dave, yeah, Royal Sports is is that's your where it is. The incredible many exclusives as well over at Royal that you can't get anywhere else for Bomber Grey Cup Championship gear. All right, let's get to the cool bet lines before we finish. And uh, you know what I'm watching tonight, and you should too, folks. Canada, El Salvador, 8 p.m. The quest to qualify for the World Cup continues. And Canada is a minus 125 favorite to win. A draw plus 230. And El Salvador, a big underdog at home, plus 422. There's actually three other games in the uh, CONCACAF qualification tonight. Costa Rica and Jamaica, that's certainly the closest game for the odds. I'm on Costa Rica, plus 165. That number's come down a little bit. Uh, the U.S. is a heavy favorite against Honduras at minus 556. And the Mexicans, minus 278 going up against uh, Panama. Gave this out on the lock shop yesterday. Let's just see what the number is right now on it. Costa Rica, USA, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, okay, that parlay was just over plus 700 yesterday. It's plus 665. Certainly the Costa Rica, I think, the toughest game. But uh, looking forward to all of it. Uh, a number of things need to happen, including Honduras to beat the States tonight, which I don't think is going to happen for Canada to officially qualify but a win tonight all but assures them a spot in the Qatar World Cup coming up in November. Hey, are you going to be watching the USA? Uh, is that Do we get that on TV, the USA-Honduras game? Have you seen what the temperature is in St. Paul? Yeah, well, <laughs> didn't you say like they're getting a lot of this weather that we've got right now and it's yeah. going to be like straight up frigid? I saw somewhere yesterday that said like minus 20 um, with the wind. <laughs> okay, so right now in St. Paul, Work USA is hosting Honduras, right? Because they don't want to have any, they want to have only American fans there. And you want to use that home advantage. Okay. Weather, the weather network.com minus 14 in St. Paul right now feels like minus 24. Wow. That sounds horrible. That should Welcome be, should be illegal. To the Twin Cities, Honduras. That should be illegal to have sporting events, uh, soccer, and that. It's so hey, horrible. Hey, it's their choice. I like it. We did it to the Mexicans in Edmonton. I mean, I don't, I don't mind using the uh, northern climates to finally get a no. little bit of home field advantage. So uh, you just don't have to go, Remus. I know you will probably won't even go outside your house today. So I might don't to worry. You might have to shovel. As you we might talked, have to shovel. We talked yesterday. <laughs> going to build a Quincy now that you've learned yeah, we're what gonna, they are. I'm going to be building a Quincy. And if you want to, if you miss that Quincy talk, it's on our Instagram, on our reels. <laughs> we're doing those now. So you're going to want to follow us. Uh, links to all our socials are in the description. You got it. Uh, we got, what, five games before the uh, NHL All-Star break officially begins. Islanders minus 208 favorites at home against the Kraken. Edmonton a minus 119 favorite in Washington to take on the Capitals. I think that number moved big time because Alex Ovechkin is on the COVID list. As we mentioned with uh, Greg Wyshynski, he will miss the All-Star game. Uh, the Kings 
minus 141 road favorites against the Detroit Red Wings. Calgary, a huge favor against the Coyotes, who are coming off that stunning extra time win over the Colorado Avalanche yesterday. Flames laying minus 270 on the road in the final game. Minnesota Wild minus 161 taken on the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, now, I, I won't go through everything, but if you go to CoolBet, you can also get through all of the Olympic odds right now, tons of futures. Mm -hmm. And of course, tonight, we've got our first mixed game with John Morris and Rachel Holman representing Canada. Can't wait to see Jen Jones and her team go for gold a little bit later on. Uh, Remo, one more night of hockey. A little AEW tonight, and of course, mm -hmm. the big game at 8 o'clock, Canada and El Salvador. And uh, we'll be back at it tomorrow with what should be a great show. Rashid Bailey's going to join us, and we'll do a big extended segment with Mike McIntyre of the Free Press on the Winnipeg Jets predicament at the All-Star break, which was compounded by that disappointing loss last night in Philly. Yeah, and one thing we didn't mention about the Jets, too, uh, Man government Manitoba announcing uh, changes to the restrictions. Did we talk about having fans... I think building. we did mention it right it, off the top, but if you're was, popping later on, we're back to 50% as of next yeah, week. Yeah, people are saying, I forget if we talked about it. You're fired not. up to go to the 50% oh, games. 50% games, going to be so much fun. Half the traffic on the way there, half the traffic on the way home, half the bathroom lines, half the concession lines. You can walk comfortably around the concourse, stretch out in your seat. Wonderful. 50% games. They should be, uh, you know, charging a bit of premium on those for all the luxury. It's like when you go to the VIP movie theater, Huss, and have all that room. Yeah, I've never been to the VIP movie theater. Actually, yeah. I don't think I've been to a movie theater yeah. in at least a decade, but that's beside the point. Um, mm -hmm. You should just go to more Moose games. You'll have tons of room. Yeah, but it's not, it's not NHL hockey. I want to see best on best. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, aren't you? Uh, are you going to be watching Olympic? You're not going to be staying up. So you're saying you're not going to be staying up for Olympic hockey, or? Well, I will. Yeah. yeah. Well, you won't because it's not best on best anymore. Yeah, it's not best on best. I'm not not interested. <laughs> so you're because... done. I mean, listen, it's not quite as good. <laughs> I frankly, I think I'm more fired up for the women's hockey uh, because that really is the best on best. And of course, there's no rivalry like Canada and the United States yeah. in women's hockey. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding around. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just, I I just wanted are. to make that make that joke. But yeah, moose games are, are fun too. I really want actually want to take my son to a moose game, but I don't know if I'll be able to sit still. He doesn't care about hockey. Yeah, well, you, I you try. keep keep working on him into next season. Maybe we'll uh, you can light the fire underneath him. There are, by the way, I mean, I guess they're still under the present restrictions right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But I did see an email that uh, there are tickets available for the Moose games on Saturday and Sunday, 2 oh. p.m. games. So if you do want to take the kid, check out moosehockey.com. We'll probably check in with the club before. And uh, uh, basically the entire taxi squad, including Billy Hainala, uh, who was on the active roster last night, Johnny Kovacevic, getting returned to the Winnipeg Jets. So uh, they'll get some more time to play coming up on the weekend. And that's big for Mark Morrison's team, which uh, has basically lost most of their roster to the Winnipeg Jets or COVID over the course of the past month. Yeah, it's been real tough. And we, we had uh, Nelson Noje on last week talking about it and Mark as well. So, and the Moose did get some bodies back today. There's no more taxi squad after the All-Star break. The Jets putting out the note this morning that they sent everyone back. They sent everyone back. Uh, Hainala, Isamont, who else? Not Pogansky. Oh, here it is. Burden, Chisholm, Gavanke, Hainala, Kovacevic, Isamont, Reichel. So that's who got sent down. Yeah. I mean, big I, smile from Mark Morrison to get those guys mm -hmm. back uh, ahead of, uh, you know, some big games for this club as they try to maintain their position. It's sort of amazing, you know, just to finish up the program when you look at what the Moose have dealt with and what the Jets have dealt with mm -hmm. and how each team has handled it. And, uh, you know, the Jets, an incredibly disappointing spot, and the Moose, um, it's amazing how they've just continued to stack up points, get results, regardless of who's been in the lineup so far. So, uh, We'll see what happens coming out of the All-Star break. We've got some time to talk about it. Mike McIntyre is going to join us tomorrow. And, of course, we will have Showtime Sheed, Rashid Bailey, back with us. Uh, by the way, if you want to get out on those Olympic betting, they're curling tonight, soccer, and so much more over at CoolBet, use the promo code WST at CoolBet.com. For your first deposit, we'll uh, double it up to $200 over at CoolBet. By the way, CoolBet guys, very pumped. Just signed Canadian golfer Taylor Pendrith to the cool bat team. So we'll look forward to uh, reaching out, hopefully get Taylor on at some point later on during this golf season. Now, big thanks to all of our sponsors. 
I know uh, Greg from Royal Sports is in the chat. Great to see you here, my friend. Uh, Nick and Nikki DQ. Of course, Nick always hanging around. Not Auto Court, Manitoba Battery, Vita Health, F Apparel, Culligan Water, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, Canadian Club Whiskey, and uh, Cool Bet Canada. Folks, enjoy the soccer tonight. Go Canada. We'll be back tomorrow with more on the Jets at the break and Rashid Bailey, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Thanks for being with us and have a great night. Oh my God! Oh! Shut it down! Let's go! Home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at WinnipegSportsTalk.com.